ഓക്കെ താങ്ക് യു അപ്പോ ഈ വന്നിരിക്കുന്ന ഗ്യാദറിങ്സ് എല്ലാവരെയും സ്വാഗതം ചെയ്യുന്നതിനും നമ്മുടെ ഇന്നത്തെ മുഖ്യ അതിഥി സയന്റിസ്റ്റ് ജാസ്പർലാലിനെ പരിചയപ്പെടുത്തുന്നതിനുമായിട്ട് വൈ എം സിയുടെ അക്കാഡമിക് പ്രോഗ്രാം കമ്മിറ്റി ചെയർമാൻ ഡോക്ടർ ബിജോയ് എം എസ് രാജിനെ ഞാൻ സാദരം ക്ഷണിക്കുന്നു ആദരണീയനായ യോഗ അധ്യക്ഷൻ ഐ എം സിയുടെ പ്രസിഡന്റ് ഷെവരാർ ഡോക്ടർ കോശി എം ജോർജ് സാർ വിശിഷ്ട അതിഥി സി ജാസ്പർ ലാൽ സാർ ഈ പ്രോഗ്രാമിന്റെ മോഡറേറ്റർ ആയിട്ടിരിക്കുന്ന സ്നേഹമുള്ള എം ജി ജെയിംസ് സാർ ഏറ്റവും സ്നേഹമുള്ള കുട്ടികളെ രക്ഷിതാക്കളെ വൈ എം സി അംഗങ്ങളെ നാല് ദിവസത്തെ വ്യത്യസ്തമായ ഒരു പ്രോഗ്രാമാണ് നാം മുന്നോട്ട് ഇപ്പോൾ നാലാം ദിവസത്തിലേക്ക് കടന്ന് നമ്മൾ മുന്നോട്ട് പോയിക്കൊണ്ടിരിക്കുന്നത് വളരെ വ്യത്യസ്തമായിട്ടുള്ള ചിന്തയും വ്യത്യസ്തമായിട്ട് വളരെ പ്രയോജനകരമായിട്ടുള്ള ഒരു പ്രോഗ്രാം കഴിഞ്ഞ മൂന്ന് ദിവസത്തെ പ്രഭാഷണങ്ങളും എങ്ങനെ ഉണ്ടായിരുന്നു എന്ന് ഞാൻ പറയുന്നതിനേക്കാളും നിങ്ങളുടെ അനുഭവത്തിലൂടെ നിങ്ങൾക്ക് അത് മനസ്സിലാക്കാൻ സാധിച്ചിട്ടുണ്ട് എന്ന് ഞാൻ വിശ്വസിക്കുന്നു നാലാം ദിവസമായിട്ടുള്ള എന്ന് ആൻഡ് ഇൻട്രൊഡക്ഷൻ ടു എയർക്രാഫ്റ്റ് എന്ന വിഷയത്തിലാണ് ജാസ്പർ ലാൽ സാറ് സംസാരിക്കുന്നതെന്ന് നമുക്ക് മനസ്സിലാക്കാൻ സാധിച്ചിട്ടുണ്ട് പ്രിയമുള്ളവരെ ഞാൻ എൻ്റെ കർത്തവ്യത്തിലേക്ക് കടക്കട്ടെ ആദ്യമായിട്ട് ഇങ്ങനെയുള്ള ഈ പുതിയൊരു ആശയം അക്കാഡമിക് കമ്മിറ്റിക്ക് പങ്കുവച്ച ഏറ്റവും സ്നേഹമുള്ള ഷിവിലയർ ഡോക്ടർ കോശ്യം ജോർ സാർ അദ്ദേഹം ആദ്യ ദിവസം പറഞ്ഞിരുന്നു അദ്ദേഹം പി എസ് എസ് സിന്ന് റിട്ടയർ ചെയ്ത ഡെപ്യൂട്ടി ഡയറക്ടർ ഡയറക്ടർ തസ്തിയിൽ നിന്ന് റിട്ടയർ ചെയ്ത ഒരു സയന്റിസ്റ്റ് ആണ് അദ്ദേഹത്തിന്റെ ആശയമായിരുന്നു ഇത് എന്ന് തുറന്നു പറയുന്നതിൽ എനിക്ക് വളരെ സന്തോഷമുണ്ട് അദ്ദേഹത്തിന്റെ കൂടെ എം ജി ജെയിംസ് സാർ കൂടിയപ്പോൾ ഇത് ഏറ്റവും വിജയപ്രദമായിട്ടുള്ള ഒരു പ്രോഗ്രാമായിട്ട് മാറി എന്ന് ഞാൻ സന്തോഷത്തോടെ പറയട്ടെ അതുപോലെ തന്നെ വളരെ മികച്ച രീതിയിൽ പ്രവർത്തിച്ച പ്രവർത്തന പരിചയമുള്ള പലരും നയന സാർ കെ നയന സാർ പറഞ്ഞു വളരെ വളരെ മികച്ച രീതിയിൽ ഏതാ നമ്മുടെ വി എസ് എസ് സി ആയിട്ടും ഐ എസ് ആർ ആയിട്ടും ബന്ധമുള്ള വളരെ മികച്ച വ്യക്തിത്വങ്ങൾ ഉള്ള ഒരു ഒരു വൈ എം സി ആണ് തിരുവനന്തപുരം വൈ എം സി ഐയിൽ അവിടുത്തെ ഒരു അംഗം എന്ന നിലയിൽ ഞാൻ വളരെ സന്തോഷപൂർവ്വം ഈ നിമിഷം എന്റെ അനുഭവം പങ്കുവയ്ക്കട്ടെ ഞാന് ഏറ്റവും സ്നേഹമുള്ള കോശി സാറിനെ ഏറ്റവും ആദരവോടെ ഈ പ്രോഗ്രാമിലേക്ക് വളരെ ലളിതമായ വാക്കുകളോട് സ്വാഗതം ചെയ്യുന്നു സ്വാഗതം കോശി എം ജോസ് താങ്ക് യു സാർ അടുത്തതായിട്ട് ഇന്നത്തെ വിശിഷ്ട ആദ്യ നാലാമത്തെ ദിവസത്തെ ഇന്നത്തെ ക്ലാസ് എടുക്കുന്നതിനായിട്ട് കടന്നു വന്നിരിക്കുന്ന വളരെ അനുഭവ സമ്പത്തുള്ള ജോലിയിൽ മാത്രമല്ല ഒരു അധ്യാപകനായിട്ടൊക്കെ പ്രവർത്തിക്കുന്ന ഒരു വ്യക്തിത്വമാണ് ജാസ്പർ ലാൽ സാർ അദ്ദേഹം നയൻറ്റീൻ എയ്റ്റി വണ്ണില് ഐ ഐ ടി ബോംബെയിൽ നിന്ന് എയറോണോട്ടിക്കൽ എഞ്ചിനീയറിങ്ങിലെ ബി ടെക് ബിരുദം നേടുകയും എയറോണോട്ടിക്കൽ എഞ്ചിനീയറിങ്ങിൽ തന്നെ നയൻറ്റീൻ എയ്റ്റി ഫോറില് അദ്ദേഹം ഐ ഐ ടി മദ്രാസിൽ നിന്ന് എം ടെക് ബിരുദം നേടുകയും ചെയ്ത വ്യക്തിയാണ് അദ്ദേഹം തുടർന്ന് ഐ എസ് ആർ ഒയില് ജോയിൻ ചെയ്തു അദ്ദേഹം മുപ്പത്തി മൂന്നര വർഷം അവിടെ സെർവ് ചെയ്തു ജോലി ചെയ്ത ഒരു വ്യക്തിത്വമാണ് ടൂ തൗസൻഡ് സെവൻറ്റിയിൽ അദ്ദേഹം ഗ്രൂപ്പ് ഹെഡ് ആയിട്ട് അദ്ദേഹം റിട്ടയർ ചെയ്തു അതിന്റെ ഗ്രൂപ്പ് ഹെഡിന്റെ ആ ഗ്രൂപ്പിന്റെ പേരാണ് പ്രൊഫഷൻ ഗ്രൂപ്പ് അദ്ദേഹം വിവിധമായിട്ടുള്ള ഡെവലപ്മെന്റ്സിന് അദ്ദേഹം ഇൻവോൾവ് ചെയ്തിട്ടുണ്ട് എ എസ് എൽ വി പി എസ് എൽ വി ജി എസ് എൽ വി എൽ വി എം ത്രീ ആർ എൽ വി ടി ഡി ലോഞ്ച് വെഹിക്കിൾസിന്റെ പ്രൊപ്പൾഷൻ സിസ്റ്റത്തിലും എസ്റ്റാബ്ലിഷ്മെന്റ് ഓഫ് മേജർ ആർ ആൻഡ് ഡി ഫെസിലിറ്റീസ് അതിലൊക്കെ അദ്ദേഹം ഇ എസ് എസ് സിയുടെ ഭാഗമായിരുന്നു അദ്ദേഹം ഹീറ്റ് ട്രാൻസ്ഫർ നോസിൽസ് റോക്കറ്റ് ടെസ്റ്റിംഗ് ആൻഡ് സെൻസേഴ്സ് എക്സ്പേർട്ട് ദ വേൾഡ് ഹിസ്റ്ററിയിലൊക്കെ അദ്ദേഹം ലോകത്തിന്റെ ഒക്കെ ചരിത്രത്തിന്റെ ഭാഗമായിട്ട് അദ്ദേഹം എക്സ്പേർട്ട് ഈ വിഷയങ്ങൾക്ക് അദ്ദേഹം എക്സ്പേർട്ട് ആയിരുന്നു റെസിപ്യൻറ്റ് ഓഫ് ദി ഐ എസ് ആർ ഒ ടീം എക്സലൻസ് അവാർഡ് ഫോർ ഡെവലപ്മെന്റ് ഓഫ് ദി എസ് ടു ഹൺഡ്രഡ് മോട്ടോസ് ആൻഡ് ഓൾസോ റെസിപ്യൻറ്റ് ഓഫ് ദി പി എൽ എച്ച് ഇ എം എസ് ഐ ടീം അവാർഡ് ഫോർ ഡിസൈൻ ഡെവലപ്മെന്റ് ആൻഡ് ഇൻട്രൊഡക്ഷൻ ഓഫ് ദി എസ് ടു ഹൺഡ്രഡ് മോട്ടോ അദ്ദേഹം എയറോണോട്ടിക്കൽ സൊസൈറ്റി ഓ
അദ്ദേഹം ഇൻസ്റ്റിറ്റ്യൂട്ട് ഓഫ് എഞ്ചിനീയറിങ്ങിന്റെ ഫെലോ ആയിട്ടും ഈ കാലഘട്ടത്തിൽ പ്രവർത്തിച്ചു വരുന്നു അദ്ദേഹം ഇരുപത്തിയഞ്ചിലധികം ഇന്റർനാഷണൽ പബ്ലിക്കേഷൻസിൽ അദ്ദേഹത്തിന്റെ സ്വന്തം പേരിലുണ്ട് അങ്ങനെ അങ്ങനെ അദ്ദേഹം വളരെ 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 മികച്ച രീതിയിൽ അദ്ദേഹത്തിന്റെ പ്രവർത്തന പരിചയം എങ്ങനെ എങ്ങനെ ക്ലാസ്സുകൾ എടുക്കാവുന്ന രീതിയിലൊക്കെ അദ്ദേഹം അദ്ദേഹം റിസർച്ചിലൊക്കെ വളരെ വളരെ പ്രവർത്തന പരിചയമുള്ളൊരു വ്യക്തിത്വമാണ് അദ്ദേഹം നമ്മളെ ഏറ്റവും നമ്മുടെ അദ്ദേഹം പറഞ്ഞ എം ഡി ജെയിംസ് സാർ പറഞ്ഞ പോലെ ഒരു പക്ഷി പറക്കുന്നത് കണ്ട് സ്വപ്നം കണ്ട് റൈറ്റ് ബ്രദേഴ്സ് ഒക്കെ അവരുടെ ഡ്രീംസ് അവര് 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 എങ്ങനെയാണ് അവര് അത് സ്വന്തമാക്കിയത് പോലെ ആ രീതിയിൽ എന്താണ് അതിന്റെ കാര്യങ്ങളെല്ലാം വളരെ വ്യക്തമായിട്ട് സാർ പറയുമെന്ന് ഞാൻ വിശ്വസിക്കുന്നു എന്റെ കർത്തവ്യം അദ്ദേഹത്തെ സ്വാഗതം ചെയ്യുന്നതാണ് ഏറ്റവും ആദ്യ പൂർവ്വം രാസ്കലാൻ സാറിനെ ഇന്നത്തെ ലക്ഷ സീരീസിന്റെ നാലാം ദിവസത്തിലേക്ക് സ്വാഗതം ചെയ്യുന്നു സ്വാഗതം ജാസ്കലാൻ സാർ ഏറ്റവും സ്നേഹമുള്ള എം ജി ജെയിംസ് സാറ് നാലാമത്തെ ദിവസവും വളരെ മികച്ച രീതിയിൽ അദ്ദേഹത്തിന് കർത്തവ്യം ചെയ്തുകൊണ്ടിരിക്കുന്നു പ്രത്യേകിച്ച് ഞാൻ അദ്ദേഹത്തെ പരിചയപ്പെടുത്തേണ്ടതില്ല കാരണം അദ്ദേഹമാണ് കുട്ടികളുമായിട്ടും പാരൻസുമായിട്ടും ഈ പ്രോഗ്രാം ചെയ്യുന്ന വരുന്ന ലെക്ചേഴ്സുമായിട്ട് ഒക്കെ ഇടപെട്ട് നിൽക്കുന്നത് അദ്ദേഹത്തിന് ഏറ്റവും സ്നേഹത്തോടെ ഏറ്റവും ഔപചാ ഔപചാരികതയുടെ പേരിൽ ഞാൻ അദ്ദേഹത്തെ ഈ ലെക്ചർ സീരീസിലേക്ക് അദ്ദേഹത്തെ സ്വാഗതം ചെയ്യുന്നു കുഞ്ഞുങ്ങളാണ് ഞങ്ങളുടെ അസെറ്റ്സ് എന്നും എപ്പോഴും മികച്ച മികച്ച സന്തോഷത്തോടെ ഞാൻ തുറന്നു പറയുന്ന കാര്യമാണ് കാരണം ഞങ്ങൾ എല്ലാ പ്രോഗ്രാംസിനും ഐ എം സിയുടെ ഇപ്പൊ നടന്നുകൊണ്ടിരിക്കുന്ന പ്രോഗ്രാംസ് വളരെ വളരെ സിവിൽ സർവീസിന്റെ ഫൗണ്ടേഷൻ പ്രോഗ്രാം ആയാലും അങ്ങനെ അങ്ങനെ ഒരുപാട് ഒരുപാട് മത്സരങ്ങളും ഒത്തിരി കാര്യങ്ങൾ ഞങ്ങൾ ചെയ്യുന്നു പക്ഷെ ഈ പ്രോഗ്രാം വളരെ വ്യത്യസ്തമുള്ള ഒരു പ്രോഗ്രാമാണ് ഇത് തുറന്നു കൊണ്ട് പോകണമെന്നാണ് അതിനെ കുറിച്ച് എന്തെങ്കിലും രണ്ട് വാക്ക് ജോസിയും ജോർ സാർ പറയുമെന്നാണ് ഞാൻ വിശ്വസിക്കുന്നത് കാരണം ഇത് വളരെ മികച്ച രീതിയിലുള്ള പ്രാക്ടീസിനെ പരിചയപ്പെടുത്തുന്നതുകൊണ്ട് കുട്ടികൾക്ക് ഒരു വിഷൻ നൽകുന്ന ഒരു പ്രോഗ്രാമാണ് അപ്പൊ ഇത് ഇതുകൊണ്ട് നിന്ന് പോകരുത് എന്ന് ഞാൻ ആഗ്രഹിക്കുന്നത് അതിനെ കുറിച്ച് കോശ സാർ അതിനെ കുറിച്ച് ഒന്ന് ഒന്ന് രണ്ട് നല്ല കാര്യങ്ങൾ കുട്ടികൾക്ക് ഒരു അവർക്ക് ഫ്യൂച്ചറിലേക്ക് അവർക്ക് ഈ ഒരു പ്രോഗ്രാം ഇനിയും മുന്നോട്ട് കൊണ്ടുപോകും അതിനെ കുറിച്ച് പറയുമെന്ന് ഞാൻ വിശ്വസിക്കുന്നു അത് കുഞ്ഞുങ്ങൾക്ക് വളരെ പ്രയോജനം ചെയ്യാൻ കാരണം ഇനിയും ഒത്തിരി ആൾക്കാരെ നിങ്ങൾക്ക് പരിചയപ്പെടുത്തുവാനായിട്ട് കോച്ച് സാറിനും എം ജി ജെയിംസ് സാറിനും അനോൺസ് സാറിനൊക്കെ സാധിക്കുമെന്ന് ഞാൻ വിശ്വസിക്കുന്നു അതുകൊണ്ട് അതുകൊണ്ട് കുഞ്ഞുങ്ങൾക്ക് ഈ മൂന്നാമത്തെ പ്രോഗ്രാമും ഈ ഇന്നത്തെ പ്രോഗ്രാമും ഒക്കെ വളരെ വളരെ അനുഭവപ്രദമായിരിക്കുന്നു ഞാൻ വിശ്വസിക്കുന്നു കുഞ്ഞുങ്ങളെയും രക്ഷിതാക്കളെയും ജെയിംസിന്റെ മുമ്പോസിനെ ഒക്കെ ഞാൻ ഈ പ്രോഗ്രാം സ്വാഗതം ചെയ്യുന്നു പിന്നിൽ പ്രവർത്തിച്ച ഏറ്റവും സ്നേഹമുള്ള രാജി ജെയിംസ് വൈ എം സി ജനറൽ സെക്രട്ടറി ഉണ്ട് ഒറ്റ വാക്കില് ഞാൻ അദ്ദേഹത്തെ സ്വാഗതം ചെയ്തുകൊണ്ട് ഞാൻ എന്റെ വാക്കുകൾ എന്നാൽ വിരമിക്കുന്നു നന്ദി 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 നമസ്കാരം നമ്മളുടെ അധ്യക്ഷ പ്രസംഗമാണ് പ്രസിഡൻഷ്യൽ അഡ്രസ്സിന് വേണ്ടിയിട്ട് വൈ എം സി എയുടെ പ്രസിഡന്റ് സ്നേഹമുള്ള ഷവലയർ ഡോക്ടർ കോശി എം ജോർജിനെ ക്ഷണിക്കുന്നു ഈ സൗമീറ്റിങ്ങിലായിരിക്കുന്ന എല്ലാവർക്കും എന്റെ വിനീതമായ നമസ്കാരം ഈ നാലാമത്തെ ദിവസവും വളരെ സന്തോഷത്തോടു കൂടിയാണ് ഞാൻ കടന്നു വന്നിരിക്കുന്നത് കഴിഞ്ഞ മൂന്ന് ദിവസവും ഏറ്റവും ഭംഗിയായി ഈ ക്ലാസ് നടക്കുന്നതിന് ഈശ്വരൻ സഹായിച്ചു ഈശ്വരനും ഞാൻ നന്ദി പറയുകയാണ് ഇന്നത്തെ മുഖ്യ പ്രഭാഷകൻ എയർക്രാഫ്റ്റിനെ കുറിച്ച് നമ്മോട് സംസാരിക്കുന്ന എന്റെ ഏറ്റവും അടുത്ത സുഹൃത്ത് ഒരുമിച്ച കൊളീഗ്സ് ആയിരുന്നു പ്രിയപ്പെട്ട ജാസ്പർലാലിനെ ഞാൻ സ്നേഹപൂർവ്വം ഒരിക്കൽ കൂടി സ്വാഗതം ചെയ്യുന്നു മറ്റേ സന്തോഷമുള്ളത് നമ്മുടെ ഡോക്ടർ കെ എൻ എനാൻ സാർ ഇതിനകത്ത് സംബന്ധിക്കുന്നു എം സി ദത്തൻ സാറും സംബന്ധിക്കുമെന്ന് പറഞ്ഞിട്ടുണ്ട് അതാണ് ഞാൻ ഇന്നലെയും പറഞ്ഞതുപോലെ ഇതൊരു വലിയ കൂട്ടായ്മയായിട്ട് നമ്മളിത് തുടങ്ങിയെങ്കിലും ഒരു ചെറിയ രീതിയിൽ ഇത് തുടങ്ങിയെങ്കിലും നമ്മുടെ ഈ മെൻറ്റേഴ്സ് ഒക്കെ നമ്മുടെ കൂടെ ഈ പിറ്റേ ദിവസവും ഒരു സമയം കണ്ടെത്തി ഇതിന് വരുന്നു എന്ന് പറയുന്നത് എത്രമാത്ര സന്തോഷം ഉള്ള ഒരു കാര്യമാണെന്ന് അറിയാമോ നമ്മുടെ പ്രൊഫസർ അനന്ത നാരായണന് മാത്രം ഇന്ന് ഐ ഐ എസ് ടി ക്ലാസ് ഉണ്ട് അതുകൊണ്ട് അദ്ദേഹത്തിന് ഇന്ന് ഇതിനകത്ത് പങ്കെടുക്കാനായിട്ട് ഒപ്പുന്നില്ല നമ്മുടെ ജോർജ് ഗോസ് സാർ കൂടെ ഉണ്ട് ഇന്നലെ അദ്ദേഹത്തെ പരിചയപ്പെടുത്തിയതാണ്
എന്നുള്ള ഒരു ആശയമാണ് അല്ലെങ്കിൽ ഒരു റിക്വസ്റ്റ് ആണ് ഞങ്ങൾക്ക് കിട്ടുന്നത് അത് എൻ്റെ കൊച്ചു കൂട്ടുകാരികളെല്ലാം കേൾക്കുക കൂട്ടുകാരന്മാരും കൂട്ടുകാരികളും കേൾക്കുക ഞങ്ങൾ ഇത് ഉടനെ നിർത്തുന്ന നിർത്തുന്ന പ്രശ്നമില്ല കാരണം നിങ്ങളുടെ ഈ ആവേശം കണ്ടിട്ട് ഞങ്ങൾ ഈ പ്രായമുള്ളവരല്ലെങ്കിൽ ഞങ്ങൾക്ക് പോലും ആവേശം തോന്നുന്നു നിങ്ങളുടെ ഈ ആവേശം കണ്ടിട്ട് അപ്പൊ അതുകൊണ്ട് ഞങ്ങൾ ഈ ക്ലാസ് നിർത്താൻ പോകുന്നില്ല ഈ നാല് ദിവസത്തെ ക്ലാസ് ഇന്നിവിടെ അവസാനിക്കുമെങ്കിലും നമ്മളൊരു വാട്സാപ്പ് ഗ്രൂപ്പ് തുടങ്ങിയിട്ടുണ്ട് ആ ഗ്രൂപ്പ് ഞങ്ങൾ നിർത്തുന്നില്ല നിങ്ങൾ ആരെങ്കിലും ഇഷ്ടമായിട്ട് സ്വന്തമായിട്ട് നിങ്ങൾക്ക് ലീവ് ചെയ്ത് പോകണമെങ്കിൽ യാതൊരു തടസ്സവും ഇല്ല നിങ്ങൾക്ക് ലെറ്റാകാം അബ്സൊല്യൂട്ട്ലി നോ പ്രോബ്ലം പക്ഷെ ഞങ്ങളായിട്ട് ഈ വാട്സാപ്പ് ഗ്രൂപ്പ് നിർത്തുന്നില്ല ആ വാട്സാപ്പ് നമ്പർ നിങ്ങളുടെ എല്ലാം കയ്യിലുണ്ട് ഇനി നിങ്ങളുടെ കൂട്ടുകാർക്ക് ആർക്കെങ്കിലും അതിനകത്ത് പങ്കെടുക്കണമെന്ന് വരികിൽ നിങ്ങൾ അതിനകത്ത് പങ്കെടുക്കണം അതിൻ്റെ നമ്പര് നിങ്ങൾ പേനയോ ഇതുള്ളവരെ എഴുതിയെടുക്കുക നയൻ ഫോർ നയൻ സിക്സ് സീറോ സീറോ സെവൻ ഫൈവ് ഫൈവ് സെവൻ ഞാൻ ഒന്നുകൂടെ പറയുന്നു നയൻ ഫോർ നയൻ സിക്സ് സീറോ സീറോ സെവൻ ഫൈവ് ഫൈവ് സെവൻ ഇത് നമ്മുടെ മറ്റാരുടെയോ അല്ല നമ്മുടെ എം ജി ജെയിം സാറിൻ്റെ നമ്പരാണ് അദ്ദേഹമാണ് ഇത് മോഡറേറ്റ് ചെയ്യുന്നത് അപ്പം അദ്ദേഹം നിങ്ങളെ തുടർന്നും മെൻറ്റർ ചെയ്തുകൊണ്ടിരിക്കും അതായത് ഞങ്ങൾ ഉദ്ദേശിക്കുന്നത് നിങ്ങൾക്ക് ഇതുപോലെയുള്ള ഒരു ക്ലാസ് ഇപ്പം നമ്മുടെ നാല് പേര് കൂടെ ഉണ്ട് നയന സാറൊക്കെ പറയുന്നത് ഇനിയും മറ്റ് വിഷയങ്ങളെക്കുറിച്ചും സയൻസ് വിഷയങ്ങളെക്കുറിച്ച് ക്ലാസ് എടുക്കാമെന്നാണ് പറയുന്നത് ഐ എസ് ആർ ഐയെക്കുറിച്ചും എയർക്രാഫ്റ്റിനെ കുറിച്ചും മറ്റ് സയൻസ് വിഷയങ്ങളെക്കുറിച്ചും നമ്മുടെ കേരളത്തിൽ നിന്ന് റിട്ടയർ ചെയ്ത് ഒരുപാട് സീനിയർ സയൻറ്റിഫിക് ഓഫീഷ്യൽസ് ഉണ്ട് അവർ മറ്റ് വിഷയങ്ങളെക്കുറിച്ച് ക്ലൈമറ്റിനെ കുറിച്ച് അങ്ങനെ ഒരുപാട് കാര്യങ്ങൾ കുട്ടികൾ അറിയേണ്ടതായ പല കാര്യങ്ങളുണ്ട് അപ്പം ഇത് ഞങ്ങൾ വിചാരിക്കുന്നത് അടുത്ത മാസം തൊട്ട് കുറഞ്ഞത് ഞാൻ പറയട്ടെ ഒരു മാസം നിങ്ങൾക്ക് ഒരു ലെക്ചർ എങ്കിലും രണ്ട് ലെക്ചർ ഞങ്ങളെ പ്രതീക്ഷിക്കുന്നു അങ്ങനെ നമുക്കിത് മുൻപോട്ട് കൊണ്ടുപോയാൽ നമുക്കിത് വളരെ ഭംഗിയായിട്ട് മുന്നോട്ട് കൊണ്ടുപോകാനായിട്ട് പറ്റും പ്രത്യേകിച്ചും ഇന്നത്തെ ഈ ഓൺലൈൻ്റേതായ യുഗത്തിൽ നിങ്ങൾ മറ്റ് ക്ലാസ്സുകളൊക്കെ പഠിക്കുന്ന കൂട്ടത്തിൽ നിങ്ങളുടെ സർവതോമുഖമായ സയൻസ് ആ അതിൻ്റെ പുരോഗതിയെ ലക്ഷ്യമാക്കി നിങ്ങളുടെ വിജ്ഞാനം വർദ്ധിപ്പിക്കത്തക്ക തരത്തിൽ വൈ എം സിയെ കഴിയുന്നതെല്ലാം ചെയ്യുമെന്ന് വൈ എം സിയുടെ പ്രസിഡന്റ് എന്നുള്ള നിലയിൽ ഞാനതിൻ്റെ ഉത്തരവാദിത്വം ഏറ്റെടുക്കുകയും നിങ്ങളോട് കൂടെ ഈ കുഞ്ഞുങ്ങളുടെ ഈ ആവേശം കണ്ടിട്ട് ഞാൻ പറഞ്ഞല്ലോ ഞങ്ങൾക്കത് വളരെ സന്തോഷമുണ്ട് അതിനെ തുടർന്ന് മുന്നോട്ട് കൊണ്ടുപോകാനുള്ള എല്ലാ സഹായങ്ങളും തിരുവനന്തപുരം വൈ എം സി എ ചെയ്യുമെന്ന് ഇതിനകത്ത് പങ്കെടുത്തിരിക്കുന്ന കുട്ടികളോടും അവരുടെ രക്ഷിതാക്കളോടും എന്നെ കേൾക്കുന്ന സീനിയർ മെമ്പേഴ്സിനോടും ഉറപ്പ് തരുവാൻ ഈ അവസരം ഞാൻ വിനിയോഗിക്കുകയാണ് അപ്പം നിങ്ങൾ ഈ നമ്പർ ഉപയോഗപ്പെടുത്തുക നമ്മുടെ ജെയിംസ് സാറ് ഇതിനെ നിങ്ങൾക്കൊരു ഫീഡ്ബാക്ക് ഒക്കെ ഇതിനകത്തൂടെ ഇട്ട് തരുമെന്ന് ഞാൻ പ്രതീക്ഷിക്കുകയാണ് അദ്ദേഹം അത് അവസാനം പറയുന്നത് അതിനനുസരിച്ച് നിങ്ങൾ പ്രതികരിക്കുകയാണെന്ന് വരിയിൽ ഇതിനെ മുൻപോട്ട് കൊണ്ടുപോകാം ഇത് ഇത് മാത്രമേ ഉള്ളൂ ഒറ്റ ഇൻട്രസ്റ്റേ ഉള്ളൂ സയൻസ് പ്രൊമോഷൻ അതിന് വൈ എം സി എ ഒരു മുഖാന്തരമാകുന്നു എല്ലാ കുട്ടികൾക്കും സ്വാഗതം ഇന്നത്തെ ക്ലാസ് നിങ്ങൾക്ക് അനുഗ്രഹമാകട്ടെ എന്ന് പ്രാർത്ഥിക്കുന്നു എല്ലാ നന്മകളും നടന്നുകൊണ്ട് ഞാൻ നിർത്തുന്നു നന്ദി നമസ്കാരം ഇതൊരു പേരന്റ് ആണ് എനിക്ക് അറിയേണ്ടത് ഈ വാട്സാപ്പ് നമ്പറിലേക്ക് മെസ്സേജ് അയച്ചാൽ മതിയോ നിങ്ങളുടെ ഈ വാട്സാപ്പ് നമ്പറിലേക്ക് നിങ്ങളുടെ പേര് കുട്ടിയുടെ കുട്ടിയുടെ പേര് അതിന്റെ നമ്പർ ഏത് ക്ലാസ് ഇവിടെ പറഞ്ഞാൽ നല്ലതാണ് ഞങ്ങൾ ഐഡന്റിഫൈ ചെയ്യാൻ വേണ്ടി അത് മാത്രം പിന്നെ അതുപോലെ വേറൊരു ചെറിയ റിക്വസ്റ്റും കൂടെ ഉണ്ട് ഇപ്പൊ കുട്ടികൾ ഇത് പലരും കുട്ടികൾ പല തരത്തിലുള്ള ക്ലാസ്സുകൾ അറ്റൻഡ് ചെയ്യുന്നവര ട്യൂഷൻസ് ഇപ്പൊ സ്കൂൾ തുറന്നു കഴിയുമ്പോ അതിന്റെ പിന്നെ ഒരു ഷെഡ്യൂളിലും കാണും അപ്പൊ ബുദ്ധിമുട്ടില്ലെങ്കിൽ ബിക്കോസ് ഐ വാസ് ഓൾസോ വാച്ചിങ് ഓൾ ദി ത്രീ ഐ എം എ ജേർണലിസ്റ്റ് വിത്ത് വർക്കിംഗ് വിത്ത് ഹിന്ദു അപ്പൊ എനിക്കാണെങ്കിൽ ഇതിൽ ഐ ഇറ്റ് വാസ് ഇങ്ങനത്തെ ഒരു കാര്യം നടക്കാൻ വേണ്ടി ഐ യൂസ് ടു റിയലി വിഷ് അപ്പൊ ഐ ഹാഡ് സ്പോക്കൺ ടു സം സയൻസ് ഗ്രൂപ്പ്സ് ഓൾസോ ഇൻ ട്രിവാൻഡ്രം ഫോർ സച്ച് തിങ്സ് അപ്പൊ നിങ്ങൾ ഇതിൽ വന്നതിൽ ഞാൻ വളരെ സന്തോഷമാണ് ഇങ്ങനത്തെ ഒരു കൂട്ടായ്മ വന്നതിൽ അപ്പൊ
Um, before I invite uh, Sri Jasper Lal, let me make few announcements. Uh, the idea is, you know, at the end, so, so many people may leave early also. So I want to make the announcement uh, right now. But what are the things that are mostly? One of the you know, the class of signing, you know, is the signing to get you. Uh, we would like to get your feedback. All who have attended, kindly send us a feedback. I will put a questionnaire in our WhatsApp group. Small question, yes or no type of answers only, very easy thing only. So whoever is uh, feeling uh, you know, interested, you can respond to that. Uh, it is not that it's, you have to respond. I am requesting you to, to respond. So that questionnaire in the afternoon, what's up, group panel? So then you can respond to him. I will go to the very guy in parade day. I need to know the English Mikuar of a pretty what's up, group members are. But still, there may be someone who has got the uh, Zoom link from your friends, etc. And uh, they may not be members of the what's up group right now. I'm going to go over on the killer. You send me a message with your name, class, school, and a WhatsApp number. I will put you in that group also. Okay, so that's the first thing. And uh, second thing, as President has already told, uh, we will definitely see the possibilities of continuing this sort of classes uh, in the days to come. So uh, be active in the WhatsApp group again. Okay, let us go to the class. As I said yesterday, keep your mics definitely off. Video can be on or off, it's your preference. And uh, uh, again, a request, don't try to screen share from your side. Uh, so uh, that's it. Now at the end, we will have the question and answer session as we have been doing yesterday. Uh, you are free to type your questions in the chat box if it's a small question. Or else you can unmute yourself and ask the question. At that time, during the lectures, please keep the mics off. So let us uh, go ahead. Let us invite Sri Jasper Lal to deliver the presentation. Jasper Lal, please. Thank you, Jill. <clears throat> Hope all of you are able to hear me. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. So. Okay. Good morning to all of you. Uh, at the outset, let me uh, express my sincere gratitude to Chavalier Koshim Jat, sir. Actually, he was only the person who has brought me to this uh, series of lectures. And, uh, I'm extremely grateful to you, sir, for giving me this opportunity. And uh, as we all know, under his stewardship, OMC is really a team of motivated people now. And definitely we are looking at how it is rising, rising, rising all the way, reaching far greater heights. And we further wish him all the best in his tenure. I'm thankful to my friend James, who has been coordinating all these lectures the last uh, few days, introducing his own comments in between, and also for giving a very nice introduction today. I'm thankful to Dr. Bijay Raj, sir, chairman of the OMC Academic Committee, uh, who has been instrumental in uh, arranging this program. Very thankful to you. And uh, actually, today, uh, Datan sir had told me that he'll be joining. I do hope that he'll be joining in between. It's a honor to have him in the audience. And I'm also very thankful and honored by the presence of Dr. Nainan and uh, our George Koshi, sir, Mr. Dr. M.R.K. Nainan, and a host of other people in this meeting. And the presence of all you students is what really um, encourages or inspires us to deliver our talks. And uh, as uh, you listen to Mr. James, you know, he has given a very nice and brief introduction. Uh, today's talk most likely most way the way I have planned it because we have only one hour to go ahead. And uh, it's almost like an evalu evolution uh, rather than going on the theoretical side or giving any explanations. I'm actually looking at the evolution of aircraft from the inception. And so now I will go for my PowerPoint. Please uh, bear with me when I share the screen. Okay, so here we go. And um, the title of my talk is Introduction to Aircraft. Now, this is a very vast field, very, very vast field. So in the limited time possible, we'll just uh, um, try to go through that in, uh, as I told you, basically as an introduction to the evolution, how aircraft evolve. And, you know, to begin with, I just like to show a um, picture of bird flight. 
beautiful, graceful. I don't know what words you can use to describe the birds flying. On the left side, you find the bird uh, taking off, and on the right side, you find birds on different stages of flight. Different stages of flight, four stages. Now, as all of us can understand, you know, our forefathers long in the past, when they were living in open air, they looked at the sky, they saw birds flying all over them, overhead, and they were tied to the ground. So they were earning to fly, how to fly, how to fly. And obviously, the best way would be to copy the bird's flight. So a lot of people did that. You know, there are a lot of people who stuck feathers to their bodies, to their arms, uh, to create something like the appearance or a simulation of a bird. They climb the small mountains or big trees and then try to take off, thinking that they'll float or fly, flapping their wings. I don't have to tell you what end they would have met. Poor fellows would have broken their limbs. Little more than that would have happened. And we are familiar with the, um, you know, the legend of Icarus, Greek mythology people would have studied in your school sometimes. We are aware of the labyrinth or maze which was built in the island of Crete by the cruel king. And you know, the, the designer, Daedalus and his son, Icarus, wanted to escape the maze and they flew. They stuck actually feathers on their body with the wax and then they took off. And unfortunately, Icarus flew too close to the sun. In his enthusiasm, he decided that he was enjoying the flight so much that he went too close to the sun and the wax melted. And you can see the result in the picture, unfortunately, that was the event. So meanwhile, you know, people went on trying how to fly, how to fly. and in the 18th century, 18th century, the first flight took place, balloon flight, hydrogen, hydrogen balloon it was. And uh, these developments basically happened in France, Paris and surrounding areas. And by that time, you know, all this uh, basic uh, loss of uh, science, uh, like Charles Law, Boyle's Law, all this uh, already available, people had an idea. And they decided to fill and fly a hydrogen balloon. You know, how to generate hydrogen, you must be studying in your school. One way would be to use uh, hot sulfuric acid on iron and then, you know, generate um, hydrogen gas. So that's what they did. And it was a huge balloon and they released the balloon and balloon flow for about 20, 21 kilometers. And it was just, you know, the course of the balloon was followed by riders on horseback because those days that's the only way you can chase the balloon. And finally, you know, the balloon began to sink in a village called Ganese. And as soon as this monster from the sky started sinking, all the villagers joined together with all the weapons at their hands, like spears and machets and axes. And they attacked the balloon and tore it to pieces. You can see even a dog joining in the picture. The whole village joined together to tear up the balloon to pieces. Meanwhile, other people in France created the very first manned flight. And as James was introducing in the beginning, this is all lighter than air flight. It is, you know, balloon flight. You use, you know, hot air or use hydrogen or helium gas for that purpose. And this particular flight, you know, actually carried three people in that uh, cabin. And uh, the first flight, you know, when it has flown for about nine kilometers. And before the flight, actually, when they approached the French emperor, he said, you know, it's too risky. Let us put some condemned criminals and let them fly in the first balloon. He was against the scientists actually taking part in the flight, but they managed to convince the king, no, we will fly. And they flew successfully for about nine kilometers and they landed. So this was the first human flight, 1783 year, when actually humans were really flown. And um, I think many of you have read this book, Five Weeks in a Balloon. Uh, it also, I read it when I was in school, you know, it was 35 days in a balloon, written by Jules Verne, the greatest of all science fiction writers uh, in a French person. I'm sure, you know, 20,000 leagues under the sea from the earth to the moon, five weeks in a balloon. These are all many of his, whatever he has, uh, you know, prophesied in his uh, science fiction has literally come true. Um, and so this was one of the really adventurous and beautiful book. I recommend all of you people, if you are not read it, please do read it. So people continue to try and go ahead with balloon flights and glider flights, etc. Finally, when we came to the big moment, I don't have to explain this figure. This was uh, December 17, 1903 at Kitty Hawk in uh, USA. And uh, the Wright brothers were standing, one of them lying prone on the plane. And uh, they flew, you know, they had two or three flights on the same day. And a few hundreds of meters they covered. It was a homemade uh, plane. And uh, the engine was a piston engine plane, 12 HP engine, which they made in their own shop. And so after this day, 
uh, the artist is on work here. I request the artist to hold his uh, talents. We can see that later on. Okay. And uh, so uh, after that, aviation has never looked back after this particular event. The Wright brothers themselves, you know, continued making new planes, Wright Flyer 2, Wright Flyer 3, etc., for the next many years. Meanwhile, there has been some dispute about who really deserves the credit for the first flight. Two years before the Wright brothers, you know, there was another person called Whitehead, who was a technician in the USA, who has made this plane. He's actually posing in front of the plane with his daughter. You can see him on the left of the picture. And there is some, you know, uh, dispute whether he was really the first person. Unfortunately, there is no photo. There is no photographic evidence of him flying above the ground. So officially, still the Wright brothers get the credit. And even though there have been uh, attempts to give credit to this gentleman also, and uh, the Wright, these are some of the Wright brothers uh, later on models, which they continue to develop. And birds' uh, feathers, you know, the bird's wing shape has played a direct role in the early days of aviation. I'm sure that all of us, you know, watch uh, birds flying over our head in the morning. Even if you are living in a city, still we occasionally see birds. And uh, some of the birds like crows we see every day and eagles, magnificent how they fly. You know, you just uh, look out on them, how they glide in the air. You know, they can go on coasting or gliding in the air for hours. Just, you know, riding the currents, what we call the thermals. They rise and they fall, and they, with the gentle movement of their tails or their wingtips, they are able to gracefully turn around. And each of these uh, things have been inspiration to humans. And so in the initial days, uh, people try to model their wings, model their aeroplane wings based on birds. And here I'm just uh, showing slightly out of uh, turn one picture. This is the Arctic turn, a bird called Arctic turn. And those of you who are interested, please look up the uh, net and you know learn all about this. This is one of the greatest, in fact, the greatest migratory bird. Every year it goes from one pole to the other pole and then returns. And you'll be amazed to know this bird without any guidance, without any compass, without any GM, uh, G, GPS, without anything, it flies about 80,000 kilometers in a year. Just believe it, 80,000 kilometers. It's fantastic when you read about these birds, how they go, how they find direction, how they return, what altitude they fly. Please spend some time when you get time. Just have a look at these birds, how they go, uh, how they fly. And today, talk. Of course, we will not go into details of that one. So this is the Arctic turn. Please look into that. And then, as I was telling you, the initial uh, planes were copies of, um, you know, they try to form or copy the wing shapes of, uh, you know, uh, birds. So here you have a German plane, which is literally like a bird when you are taking the plan view. You can see how the wings, even the tail, you know, they shaped it like that of a uh, bird. So this was what has happened. And then, you know, um, I'm sure you have studied in your history classes. We had the First World War, 1914 to 1918. And uh, that was the time when airplanes have ended actually warfare. In First World War, actually, airplanes uh, started entering the world, uh, world War and, you know, supporting, either supporting the troops on the ground, are going ahead and attacking the enemy lines and so on and so forth. And this is one of the aircrafts which was used in the First World War. This happens to be a British plane, propeller plane, biplane. And then, you know, you had what are known as dogfights. Nowadays, when you're reading about all these fights in, you know, when two countries are fighting in the air, you know, you think about long range fighting. One fellow fires a missile at the other enemy aircraft and he counters it or he escapes it and so on. But in the early days of aviation, the great aviation pioneers of the first world war, you know, they used to directly engage. These are known as dogfights. So two aircraft will meet head down, and you know, both the fellows uh, try to down the other fellow, and they attack each other with uh, there will be guns and other armaments in the plane, and you know, the skill of the pilot, the skill of the machine, capability of the machine, it's all very manual. And if one fellow downs five aircraft of the enemy, then he is called as an ace. Many times you'd have heard about the ace pilot. He's an ace pilot. So officially, if you have five kills, you know, you'll be given the title of an ace. And here you have a person called the Red Baron, German pilot in the First World War, who had 80 kills. 80 kills is a record. And so he is probably the ace of the aces, as you call, one of the greatest pilots. So these are all people from the First World War planes. And so, as we have seen, the Wright brothers had what is known as a biplane. Two wings were there. And then later on, people came out with triplane. There were three planes of wings. 
and then people even came out with four wings a quadruplane quadruplanes with four wings and all that thing of course we will not go into the details certain uh, advantages and major disadvantages will be there in these models and the meanwhile the development of aircraft went ahead and uh, finally we had a metallic aircraft in 1920 till then you know as you know it was all uh, fabric and wood and all that thing people were making them out of fabric and out of wood and all that so metallic plane a passenger plane took shape somewhere in 1920 and here james was mentioning one of the greatest aviation pioneers charles lindbergh year 1927 the first atlantic flight and this you know now the plane what he used this uh, known as the spirit of st louis it is uh, preserved in some uh, museum in the usa and he was a young man at that time and uh, you read about how he went ahead with the flight you know there is no guidance there is nothing those days and he flew for 33 and a half hours i just want to show the footage if it's uh, the original footage bidding farewell to his mother charles lindberg climbed the board of spirit of st louis at 7:52 a.m. lindberg set off from roosevelt field on long island new york his goal to fly across the atlantic Lindbergh, dubbed the Lone Eagle, successfully piloted the first solo transatlantic flight, arriving in Paris in 33 and a half hours. Returning to the States, Lindbergh received a hero's welcome and the Medal of Valor from New York Governor Al Smith. The journey of Charles Lindbergh carried him into the annals of aviation history. So, um, Charles Lindbergh, you know, in his flight, a particular flight. Uh, he has flown for 33 and a half hours without any kind of a guidance. He filled his whole vehicle with fuel because he needed fuel to fly for that long distance across the ocean. And at times he was uh, trapped in cloud cover. He has come almost to the ocean level, and then he continued to fly. The courage of these pioneers, you know, unbelievable. We have to really admire these people who really pioneered flight. And so that was the era of uh, Charles Lindbergh. And then, meanwhile, there was another. class of flight taking place that is airships airships you know came into the picture somewhere around 1900s and um, they were providing actually transport transport and you know some of them look so graceful here is one uh, airship which is actually moored or anchored to a ship they are very big actually they are very long you can see here itself they are most uh, in fact is uh, longer than the ship itself and they are typically moored on masts and they are lighter than air they are usually filled with helium and uh, even people have flown with hydrogen also and uh, this thrived between you know 1910 and around 1937 or so when there was a major accident and after that unfortunately um, uh, these things have slightly gone out of favor even though a few years ago there was a british company which tried to revive uh, airships and they made a um, airship called the airlander people can go and see the net actually it was not very successful but it was there and then this was uh, the first uh, pressurized cabin now today you know when you are traveling in an aeroplane you know that outside pressure is very less and you have to be provided with comfortable atmospheric pressure so you need to pressurize the cabin so in the early days when they were flying at very low altitude there was no need to pressurize that but when you are flying at higher altitudes naturally you need to pressurize so somewhere in 1930s the pressurized cabin occurred and then you know 1939 the second world war started many of you will be familiar with the second world war 1939 to 1945 the greatest war in the human history killing you know probably 50 60 million of people or even more so germany was on one side and the britain and other allies on the other side and so that period the development of um, aeroplanes has gone up by leaps and bounds obviously as can be expected because air air warfare was one of the most important fighting theaters of the second world war and here what you have is actually a german stuka stuka is a dive bomber Now, this is one plane which actually i am showing you some particular planes which have become icons or you know legends in their time and so this stuka was a dive bomber which was actually used to terrorize troops it will actually dive from the air and then come for bombing and people will run for their lives i just want to show you a footage from a, a, this is how a dive takes place a dive bomber actually comes it executes a beautiful roll maneuver you can see the vehicle rolling and then you know it takes dives and you know dives attacks and then goes 
and i just want to show how the from a movie clip of course how it used to induce terror in the people So the Stuka, you know, had an uh, aerodynamic siren. It, uh, you could hear the siren actually, and when it was approaching, it used to really create uh, a terrific uh, fear psychosis in the troops. People used to run for their lives. So it was one of the most successful aircrafts. And then there was, you know, um, warfare took place in the air with a lot and lot of attacks from uh, this side to that side. Hundreds of planes used to take part in these attacks. Hundreds, literally 400, 500 planes in one of these raids. So this took place in the Second World War, and some of the very famous planes of the Second World War, this is known as the Spitfire. Spitfire is a uh, British uh, fighter, single engine, and uh, this was a Japanese fighter called uh, uh, Zero, uh, Mitsubishi company's uh, Zero. Uh, this is one of the most maneuverable planes ever. In fact, it has the highest kill ratio of all planes when they engaged one is to one. Or even otherwise, you know, it has shot down maximum number of enemy planes. So it is the uh, Mitsubishi Japanese uh, Zero plane. And uh, so this kind of a planes went on developing during the Second World War. Meanwhile, in 1940, the first helicopter flight took place. 1940 was the first helicopter flight. All of you know that helicopters lift off vertically. And um, uh, propeller blades are on the top, uh, called rotor blades. And um, so this was the first Sikorsky company's uh, um, VS-300 model, which flew in the year 1939 or 1940. And uh, this is, you know, uh, by the time we all know how the Second World War ended, it finally ended by, you know, the dropping of atom bombs uh, over Japan. And these are the planes, these are the B-29 bombers, which actually carried and dropped uh, the bombs over uh, Japan. You're all aware of, you know, the destruction which was caused by this. There is a lot of people who feel there is no need to really drop those atomic bombs. Some people feel yes, some people debate no. Whatever be the thing, it uh, was actually dropped on two cities, as you all know. And this is actual footage, actually. So aircraft was used to do that, uh, bring that uh, reduction. And let me just take a few minutes to explain to you the parts of an aeroplane. So here is what we have, a modern day aeroplane. And uh, you see the different parts of this aeroplane. You have the cockpit, of course, you are aware the pilot and the crew sit on the front. And then we have the fuselage, which basically houses the passengers uh, and the passenger windows, you see, from uh, the front to the back. And then you have the two wings, which generate the lift, which actually lifts the aeroplane. And then um, uh, you have the engines, which are hanging or suspended under the wings. And the wings also have things like, you know, flaps. On the back side of the wings, you have what are known as flaps, and then you have ailerons, which are used for controlling the flight. When you have to turn or you have to climb, etc., etc., you're using these flaps. And then on the tail, you have what is known as a tail plane. And uh, we have the horizontal stabilizer, elevator, and then rudder, which actually helps you to turn the plane and uh, vertical stabilizer, etc. So these are the basic components of a uh, present day aeroplane. And when an aeroplane is flying in level flight, this is actually the force diagram. You can see here, the aeroplane's engines produce thrust. You can see whether it's a jet engine or a propeller engine, whatever it is, produce thrust on the front side, towards the front, and there is an air drag. Even if you're driving a motorcycle, you'll know that air is pushing against you, and that is known as a drag. So when an aeroplane tries to go forward at high speed, actually, the air tries to block it, so you have what is known as a drag force. And the weight of the aeroplane, of course, acts vertically down, gravity, and then the lift. Lift is what is actually keeping that. So in level flight at equilibrium, all these four balanced. You can see lift is equal to weight, and thrust is equal to drag, and flight is in 
equilibrium now if we test to actually change from equilibrium when you want to climb or want to change your position some of these things have to become imbalanced either lift has to be higher than the weight or thrust has to be more than the drag for you to accelerate and so on so that is what essentially the forces on the plane are these these four so any of these flights you know whenever you are designing an airplane you try to minimize the weight what we call one important parameter is thrust to weight ratio the thrust to weight ratio you want to increase the thrust of your plane at the same time we want to reduce the weight of your plane for any flying article whether it is a rocket also the same thing holds we want actually always want to reduce the weight and so we go for lightweight material and whatever thing we can do to reduce the weight and we want to reduce the drag all the time so you do aerodynamic shaping many times you find when you are riding some high speed riders in a motorcycle or something you will find they find a put a shield in the front it's actually aerodynamically shaping the flow so that the the drag on the vehicle is actually reduced even in you know fast um, uh, um, you know ground vehicles etc you find beautiful shape in the front which is basically um, aerodynamic shape so that is the purpose is to actually reduce in a bullet train you will find actually the front is actually beautifully curved and shaped the idea is to reduce the drag okay so these are the basic forces acting on a uh, plane uh, my artist friend is back again please hold on my friend you can show your artistry later on okay we will go ahead so what provides the lift in an aeroplane what provides the lift in an aeroplane and this is an aerofoil the uh, wing shape the wing cross section of an aeroplane is actually known as an aerofoil and there component um, um, uh, explaining here i think the gentleman who is following that kindly stop disturbing the others yeah who is uh, doing the screen sharing i think yeah uh, i think the gentleman has got his attention i think now he can take it easy okay now going ahead so this is what is known as the aerofoil of a wing and uh, i have explained the parameters on that one it is uh, the connecting point from the front to the back is known as a cord and then there's a curvature on this aerofoil that is known as the camber so and you see on the left side the, the relative airflow the airflow to this cord angle is known as the angle of attack is known as the angle of attack so any flight when it is taking place we will be having actually an angle of attack then only you will be producing lift and even a zero lift also at times we be able to have uh, a lift produced if it is a suitably designed aerofoil and this is again you know explaining to you how the um, lift is actually generated uh in fact uh, i don't know whether the tensor has joined here in fact he spent some time um uh, talking to me yesterday and he was in fact suggesting to me some uh, things which i can include in fact based on his suggestion i included this slide also and this is again showing how lift is generated you see actually uh when you put an aerofoil in a flow um streamlines you know the flow whatever is taking place we call as streamlines and the streamlines actually separate they go over the aerofoil below the overfoil and uh, so the flow over the aerofoil is actually speeded up you have velocity increase there and the pressure falls bernoulli equation and the bottom you have actually higher pressure so that is actually what is causing the lift on the wing you can see that here actually on the bottom picture actually showing the integrated picture you can see actually a force diagram or a pressure integrated uh, picture there and that is how actually lift is generated on this um, aerofoil okay and this aerofoil sort of different shape and uh, uh, nowadays we can have you know for a high speed for low speed etc different air, um, airfoils and so on and now uh, it will be good if you some we can remove that james is there anything possible to remove sir I don't know who is doing this. Uh -huh. It'll be good if possible. Otherwise, we'll go ahead in any way. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, just a minute. Let me just check the options. Yeah. I I know. I think further for the further they will not be able to do it. I have disabled the annotation. But whatever he made, I don't know how we can uh, come back on that. Huh? Uh, so uh, now coming to the different types of aeroplanes. just how to go for the classification of aeroplanes so here what are known as monoplane we have seen you know the present day more, most of the aircraft are single wing so that is known as a monoplane 
biplane for example the right brothers is actually a biplane because we had two wings one below the other and then we have propeller engine the planes we have jet engine planes and then we have single engine planes multi engine planes fixed wing planes rotor like a helicopter vertical takeoff and landing vehicle unmanned aerial vehicle and so on so these are some of the classifications how we classify um, our aircraft and here what we have is a um, typical propeller aeroplane propeller aircraft here we have and uh, the engines are you find radially mounted here and with the propeller at the front end of the engine so this is a propeller engine uh, aeroplane and then we have here a jet engine now as you all know most of the present today's jet engines etc uh, per aircraft most of the transport aircraft and even fighter aircraft all of them are actually powered by jet engines so how does a jet engine work how does a jet engine work what we see here is you know in the uh, this is a schematic of a jet engine and uh, uh, the air enters from the front air enters from the front and then you are having a stages of compressors what we call compressors where the air is compressed actually whatever air enters compressed and then it enters in the middle you see what is known as the combustion chamber annular combustion chamber where fuel is injected to this uh, compressed air and then combustion takes place and then air expands through the turbine what we have on the back side and the turbine is driven by this air itself and then we have the nozzle through which um, the hot air is exhausting and thereby the thrust is produced so it's a basically a change of momentum of the air by introducing additional energy and that is what is actually providing the thrust for us for our flight so that is how a jet engine works and we have different different types of jet engines there are n number of jet engines these days with the minor modifications and uh, so here what we see was a typical jet engine and um, this you know is one of the most well known bombers of all time b52 i think many of you may be familiar with this name b52 bomber as far as i know it's the only plane with eight engines you see each of the engine actually contains two engines you can see that actually and um, this um, is one of the heaviest bombers available and uh, this in, um, ended service somewhere in 1959 or so 1959 even today it is being operated by air forces just imagine most of these airplanes you know which are once they are accepted they continue flying for years together so this particular plane which entered service in 1959 and different versions continue to fly and even today many of the air forces still operate this too and uh, these are some of the um, scenes when a b52 has gone for bombing rain you can see it dropping its uh, bombs it's a very long range flight it's a very long range it can go to tens of thousands of kilometers and of course it does uh, air to air refueling here is enough for uh, whenever any plane is actually traveling for very long distances we do air to air refueling it's a very complex operation you can see here a tanker in the front is actually allowing the b52 which is on the back side to draw in the fuel it's actually a very hazardous and difficult operation and there have been many accidents you can always uh, expect that in such a complicated operation because this happens in mid flight and both are flying at high speed they have to align themselves and just their speed and so on and then they have to capture this uh, uh, transfer line and then they have to do that so that is on uh, you know on um, in flight uh, fuel uh, fueling this is done routinely for by many long range bombers and fighter planes and this is a, a boeing 737 many of you will be familiar a boeing 737 flies even today in fact last two years it has been grounded or many of you will be aware that last two years we had a number of accidents with the, a new version of boeing 737 known as the boeing 737 max and um, it led to two crashes and then it was grounded because they introduced some complex control software and people are not able to use it and probably there are other difficulties also associated with the plane and then after being grounded for almost two years it was again allowed to fly a couple of months back and last week again i was reading they are now come out with some electrical problems in this particular plane again it is grounded 
so the points i want to convey is you know a plane once it is introduced it continues flying for 50 years 60 years this under survey somewhere in mid 60s and it continues to fly today of course every year or every few years they will be introducing improvements lot and lot of improvements will come the engines will be different and uh, you know the on the wings they introduce changes on every uh, subsystem there will be changes and improvements but the basic plane remains the same so this is the boeing 737 and um, this was uh, i'm just showing this because it has a different layout of the engines i'm sure you see that two engines are under the wings and one engine is on the tail so this is a uh, known as the lockheed tristar it's uh, by the lockheed company it is no more flying now it flew uh, in the 1980s uh, and then it was decommissioned many of you can identify this plane just by the shape of it it is the 747 jumbo jumbo entered service somewhere in 1960s i think it was in 1969 or so and it flew for uh, about 50 years till a few years ago it was continuing to fly with passengers even today it is operated as a cargo plane it's a very long range plane and it was for a very long time having the highest passenger capacity its internal uh layout is what is known as a wide bodied uh, layout and um, uh, so this is the 747 boeing 747 operated by almost all airlines air india also had to have had many of these uh, jumbos 747s and this is today's biggest plane a380 many of you will be knowing that it's at uh, you know airbus airbus a380 and uh, it is the heaviest plane today the passenger with the highest capacity it can accommodate 500 people or even more and the emirates airline is the biggest customer of this plane and it is known as the a380 and uh, it has uh, some powerful massive engines actually four two engines two engines on each side four engine totally and you can see that on the airport tarmac a380 and then uh before you know we again uh, come back to the civilian planes i just wanted to touch on it the sound the breaking of the sound barrier the right brothers plane was flying very slow you know the first world war second world war all these plane were low subsonic planes they were all pl flying at uh, speeds much lower than the speed of sound um you know when we fly faster than sound we call it actually supersonic and if you are flying lower than the speed of sound it is actually subsonic and uh, most of you have already studied in your school that uh, the velocity of sound in air is around 330 meter per second it depends on the properties of the medium of course so uh, these planes are all uh, till then all subsonic planes and finally the first supersonic flight took place in 1947 and you see the uh, pilot on the bottom said chuck eager and uh, so this was the bell x1 plane and uh, this actually was the first successful supersonic flight where the sound barrier was actually overcome the first time the humans have flown faster than the speed of sound so and that's the plane you see there uh, it had rocket engines actually the engines uh, it was powered by rockets it was dropped from a b52 and then it took off and then you know ignited these planes and uh, so this is one of the uh, momentous occasions in our history of aviation we have actually broken through the barrier and then this uh, i think many of you will be familiar with this plane it is uh, concorde it's a concorde there are so far in history there are only two supersonic transport planes one was the french uh, european concorde what you see here and the other was a russian t44 tu144 and um, so this concorde was you know um, uh, much faster than sound it was supersonic transport it flew two times faster than the speed of sound two times faster than the speed of sound and it could you know cut the travel times because all the time you are looking at in how to travel between countries before between cities between continents and supersonic transport when it flies twice the speed of sound obviously it is going to enormously reduce the travel time but then it comes with its own penalties as you can imagine this is uh, Are you able to see my share screen now? Uh, uh, sir, can you start the screen sharing once again, please? Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. Okay, is it okay? Yeah, it's coming. 
yeah that's nice so now the disturbance is gone and uh, so this concord was you know able to cut the travel time in uh, less than half because it is flying at two times the speed of sound naturally it comes with its own penalties any good thing has to come with some uh, negative thing and here it's the fuel consumption enormous amount of uh, fuel consumption by the concord olympus engines sound you know it was uh, if it is uh, flying over countries and is breaking the sound barrier it will generate what is known as the sonic booms so in your house if you are near an um, concord is coming and landing or taking off in an airport you will have breaking of the window panes and so many things it was a terrible problem with sound in fact many countries have banned from landing or taking off from india is one of them we did not have regular concord flights landing and taking off because of this um, uh, sound issues okay so i just want to show you one uh, majestic flight of a uh, not able to Just a minute. Can you again share it once again? Yeah, I think so. Um, no, we are seeing your screen only, but I think okay. you have gone out from that PowerPoint. Okay, okay. I think I'll just share it once again. Yeah. I think I'm not able to actually go forward. I think I'll have to restart probably. Okay, I think uh, we'll come back. Okay, so I just wanted to show you people, you know, how a Concord takes off. It's actually majestic to see a Concord lift off. Uh, it's like a bird of prey. Uh, I would like you people to just have a look at that. Okay, the Concorde actually was decommissioned in 2003 or so, and so now you find only Concorde in um, museums. It's unfortunate though it may be, and uh, in the future, of course, definitely there will be more supersonic transports coming up. But then people have to actually spend time on that and then design and come out with their crafts. And here, actually, many of you recognize this aircraft. This is nothing but the MiG-21. MiG-21, which has been the backbone of our Indian Air Force for almost uh, uh, four decades, four decades or so. MiG-21 entered service around 1960. Today also it is flying. You are all aware, you know, in the last year when there was uh, Balakot air strike and so on, we all read about the MiG-21 uh, BIS version, where Colonel um, Commander Abhinandan was uh, flying that one. So this is uh, perhaps the longest serving Air Force plane, the MiG-21. A Russian design, and um, um, if you um, uh, if you talk to the pilots who fly the plane, you know it's uh, really they love this plane. They love this plane. Very easy to handle, very maneuverable, very fast. Whatever one looks for in a aircraft, actually military aircraft, this airplane has it. So this is a trademark MiG-21. 
Incidentally, this has been employed by the maximum number of air forces in the world. Uh, the Russians, of course, is a Russian plane. And in the last um, uh, 50 years or so, more than 10,000 planes have been entered. So it is the largest made fighter plane serving in the maximum number of countries. And even today it is operational. The Russians are not operating this anymore. But uh, we are still operating. We are yet to phase out uh, the MiG-21. And it is even today being operated, even though there are occasionally maintenance problems. But then already in our country, we already have engine factories in, uh, I think, Koraput and uh, many places. So the components of the MiG-21 are made by our own country. There is no issue of uh, component supply. So MiG-21 continues to be operational in our Air Force and trying to support our uh, Air Force. Here is another legendary aeroplane. This is uh, known as the MiG-25. MiG-25. And um, in fact, it is perhaps the fastest aeroplane. Debatable, but then most likely this is one of the fastest, one of the fastest, surely, and perhaps the fastest aeroplane, MiG 25. Um, it has touched a maximum Mach number 3.2, that is, you know, more than three times the speed of sound. So that is the kind of uh, speed which it is uh, capable of generating. And it is used to usually as a spy plane and also as a strike aircraft interceptor because it can be so fast and so high. It flies very, very high altitude, around 60,000 feet plus. And uh, there are very, very interesting stories. There are many interesting stories, um, uh, legendary stories attached to this uh, MiG-25. And uh, we will not go into the details of that. Uh, but as far as the Indian Air Force was concerned, this was regularly being used by IAF to actually overfly Pakistan and you know, photograph Pakistan fully. And um, uh, so that has to happen quietly. They also knew that we were overflying, but they could not do anything about it because there is no other aircraft which was capable of intercepting the MiG-25 to operate um, over the Pakistani skies. And somewhere, you know, in the late 90s, one pilot actually, when he was uh, over Pakistan, over Islamabad actually, he broke the sound barrier. He actually broke the sound barrier, one of our Indian pilots. So I don't know whether it's deliberate or whatever it is. So then people suddenly realized that there's a flight overhead and then they had to answer. And then the secret was revealed that uh, the MiG-25 is regularly overflying Pakistani airspace. And it is so fast, you know, nobody could actually counter it. So this continued to fly and, and uh, give us a wonderful service till around 2005 or so. After that, of course, it has been decommissioned. The Russians also decommissioned it by around 2005 or so. Um, but this is one of the greatest aeroplanes. Uh, uh, and especially as far as the speed is concerned, uh, this is one of the fastest, if not the fastest ever. It has been actually, people have seen it on radar crossing 3.2 Mach, which is um, probably the fastest uh, number. And it can climb very well. It actually even today holds a large number of world records for speed and then for rate of climb and so many other things. Okay. And uh, many of you will be familiar with many of these aircraft. These are all present day Indian Air Force planes. What you see on the top left is the Rafael. Nowadays, we are reading every day in the paper that Rafael, we are getting a new batch of fire fails or tender fails and so on. So what do you see on the top left is a Rafael fighter. And then on the right side, you see Sukhoi. Sukhoi, a Russian Sukhoi, which is in our Air Force, Sukhoi 30. And on the bottom left, you have the Jaguar. Jaguar has been uh, in our Air Force for about two decades, more in around 2000 or so we procured it. Then on the right side bottom, you have what is known as the MiG-29, the Fulcrum. MiG-29, that's a later version of uh, MiG. So these are some of the aircrafts in the Indian Armory, and these are the world uh, fighters which are today. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, who are uh, fascinated by aircraft. Identify many of these planes. Uh, one is the Raptor and uh, F-35 and so on. And again, you have the Rafale on the left, on the bottom, and Mirage. So these are all some of these uh, modern day fighter planes. And you please see these uh, wing shapes, etc. How the shape of this aeroplane is different from uh, the Wright brothers. How it has evolved in the last 100 years. It's an entirely different thing. You see, today, the shape of the aeroplane is entirely different from what was initially flown by the Wright brothers. And so I wanted to mention to you about another legendary aeroplane. It is known as the U-2. I'm sure that many of you are familiar with that music group U2, but here is a spy plane U2. 
So the U2 uh, entered service in around 1958 or so. 1958 it has entered service, and it is flying flying even today. The U2 is flying even today, and uh, it flies very high altitude. It actually flies around uh, 80,000 feet and so on, which is you know much beyond the flying altitude of the ordinary planes. So in the last five decades or so, this has been flying all over the world and photographing, doing spying work for the US Air Force. And um, there are a large number of stories associated with this um, plane. You know, there are a large number of legendary um, achievements or things what has been done by this plane. Um, for instance, uh, one would be the Cuban missile base. According to historians, you know, the world uh, when the, the closest the world ever came to nuclear was nuclear war was in 1960s, 1961, 1962, I think. And so that was, you know, one of one of these U-2 planes which was flying over Cuba. It was taking spy photographs of the Cuban soil, and it located actually Russian missiles which were situated nuclear and nuclear missiles, Russian nuclear missiles placed in Cuba. As you all know, Cuba is very close to the American coast. And once these U-2 photos became available, Americans had to react, and uh, the world was on the brink of nuclear war for a few days because uh, they said you have to remove these uh, missiles. If you do not remove it within uh, so many hours, we will be forced to start a war. And uh, so the world was on a brink. It was the closest to your come, human race has come to mass destruction. Of course, we can come any other day also. So far, this is the oldest based on history. So the U-2 plane was instrumental in actually that particular event by taking photographs and starting that event. And then the missiles were removed, of course, the Russians removed the missiles. And uh, which is not very well known as Americans also removed many missiles which was placed in Europe, especially in Italy and other places. There was the Russian demand. It was not given much publicity. People know only that the Russians removed from Cuba. Quietly, Americans also removed their missiles from European front line. And so that particular event was de-escalated. So there was the U-2, which continues to operate today also. You just see the shape of the wings. I want you to have a look at the shape of the wings. You know, it's very long and slender. This is what is known as the aspect ratio. The length or the wingspan divided by the chord of the wing cross-section is what is known as the aspect ratio. And aspect ratio is directly related to lift production, which is actually required for flight. And here you can see, you know, this um, particular vehicle, how it is having a very high aspect ratio, flying at very high speeds, very high altitudes. Incidentally, the U-2 is not a supersonic plane, it's a subsonic plane. And then we have here another glamour plane, what is known as the SR-71. I'm sure that many of you students who are watching it today are familiar with this plane. This is again uh, one of the fastest planes ever. In fact, many people predict this being the fastest. More than Mark III, it flies. SR-71, and it is known as the Blackbird in um, colloquial terms. And you can see, you know, the engine operating there and the engine with this afterburner, you can see the exhaust of the engines there, you know, you can see the mark discs. And you see on the left side, on the um, bottom, you find the jet engine of this particular airplane. It flies at Mach 3+. Plus. And it has also traveled all over the world. It is used to take, again, photographs. Spy, spy over the other countries. And even today, for example, if there is an emergency requirement for spying on some particular country, today we are using, of course, exclusively satellites. The satellites can give you very detailed, minute pictures. Even our country, we use satellites to you know, completely track the developments in other countries. No escape for anybody from this eye in the sky, the satellites. But then satellites are already launched, you know, and they have fixed limitations. If today you want to photograph an event, a satellite cannot do that. It cannot alter it to quickly respond to that. Then you are forced to use these planes like U-2 or SR-71. And they are still very much operational, even though a number of times they have said we are decommissioning because of requirements, they keep coming back. Even though now they say SR-71 is already decommissioned, I have my own doubts. We definitely know U-2 is still flying and SR-71 also is probably flying. So among the two fastest planes for your information, one is SR-71 and the other one was the MiG-25. And both are definitely the fastest. I don't know which one is the real faster among these two. It's uh, debatable. And then uh, this was an experimental plane. And, um, you know, it is known as the X-15. 
throughout the 1960s and 70s nasa was taking you know lot of research in high speed flight even today we want to actually fly fast we want to have hypersonic flight if you want to go from say india to usa or to some other country you have to spend 14 hours 15 hours because of the limitation of traveling speed now suppose you have a hypersonic flight suppose you are going to fly three times or four times faster than sound you can cut this travel times drastically all countries in the world are working on that okay we will come to that later but then in the 1960s hypersonic flight technology was being experimented by nasa and this is actually x15 which is actually a rocket powered plane rocket powered plane and you can see the body shape how sleek and um, sharp the body is almost like that of a rocket body and uh, there were a set of you know dedicated test pilots who uh, tested this um, uh, aircraft or a space plane as you can call it and um, uh, you know the record for the fastest manned aircraft flight or space it is still held by this which was set in 1967 or so i think after 50 years or more than 55 years still this plane holds the record max 6.7 max 6.7 six times faster than the speed of sound and um, so here you have i'm sure many of you people can identify this gentleman uh, he needs no introduction but that is neil armstrong the first man on the moon who was an x15 test pilot tremendous tremendous and he has flown the x15 to max 6.7 which is you know unbelievable he was one of the greatest test pilots ever neil armstrong he became the first moon man to land on the moon it was not just by chance but i think it was a fate of destiny perhaps because temperamentally and experience wise he was one of the greatest test pilots i was reading the other day you know he has flown 200 different types of aeroplanes most of us you know in our lifetime we may drive some four or five different types of cars but this gentleman was a test pilot a test pilot is the most dangerous job in the world you know because you are trying to test fly a new plane under development is the most dangerous job and this gentleman has test flown 200 different models of airplanes which uh, you know i think it was the fate of destiny that he became the first man on the moon that's so the more i look at him so this is neil armstrong landed after flying one of those x15s and the x15 program discontinued after the 1960s one of the greatest programs by nasa okay and then coming closer to today these pipelines have been taking peculiar shapes peculiar shapes they have been changing shapes and we have seen the u2 and we have seen the sr71 and here what we have is actually what is known as a stealth plane because as you know today when we are entering into any other uh, any country say space or something immediately the radar is available you can't escape radar to escape radar you know people do all kind of things you know there are missiles like cruise missiles they fly low they try to avoid the radar by flying as you know uh, flying along the ground level you know hugging the uh, horizon or they call and uh, some other people try to fly too high uh, too fast or whatever but very little you can do to escape radar and the requirement for a spy plane or even for a bomber is to actually penetrate into the enemy airspace without being detected and how do you do that that is where stealth technology has come in so that is how these planes so you look at the shape of this plane can anybody say that such a thing is going to fly but then it flies it flies and uh, this is the f117 uh, is the 117a f117 um stealth plane and you just look at the shape of the body it is the, la the last thing you can call would be aerodynamic i was telling you about aerodynamic how to reduce drag and all that but just look at the shape and there is no way a body like this can shape uh, reduce drag or even fly for that matter and uh, even test pilots are on record telling how can such a thing fly after they look at the shape of this but it flies and it flies at high speed and uh, the stealth technology is still one of the sought after which is held still in secrecy and uh, you know you can see that the airframe is highly angular so the stealth planes have a minimal radar cross section in fact if you allow a crow to fly and allow this plane to fly they will both generate the same cross section in a radar that is how effective they are and uh, so this was you know this entered service somewhere in the late 1980s and flew till early 2000 f117a 
and um, stealth technology thrives on the angles you know which uh, prevents the radar from reflecting back they use also with very secretive material composite technology and other absorbent material coatings etc which prevents the radar from reflecting back so that is how stealth technology is achieved and uh, this is uh, the profile of the same plane what we saw uh, earlier was the front view and this is a side view f117 dropping a missile or a bomb here from the bomb bay and uh, so you can look at the peculiar shape i don't know what to call this shape it's definitely not aerodynamic the soul one can say and uh, this is another plane this uh, many, again many of you in this year will be familiar is the b2 bomber it's again a b2 bomber and uh, this again is a stealth plane stealth plane the latest stealth plane which is still operational today and uh, it is nothing but a flying wing it's a flying wing you see there is no body in that it looks like a bat i don't know how to describe this one you each of you can put your own name to this uh, particular shape it looks like a flying wing it is known as a flying wing actually it's a nothing a wing there's hardly any fuselage and you know um, uh, this is the present day um, it's a supersonic flight it's a supersonic um, uh, b2 bomber which is being used by the americans there are many other bombers also today world you know there are like the russian so heavy bombers supersonic heavy bombers which you know fly two times the speed of sound bomber is by designation you know huge clumsy plane b52 is a bomber you see long range bomber it has to penetrate enemy uh, territory and deliver the bombs is necessarily have carry heavy payload but then this is one of those uh, latest stealth which is actually able to escape your enemy radar as well as uh, deliver the payload at um, very high speeds in the enemy territory presently the technology is with the usa others are also i'm sure the very much after that and uh, chinese and um, uh, russians are after that and they have their own versions which are under development perhaps we are also definitely will be doing it shortly i have no doubt about it and uh, one day this technology will become common but as of now today it looks so strange it looks so strange this particular shape incidentally you know the flying wing concept was originally proposed by the germans in 1930s 1930s if you go back and look at some of the planes the germans had what are known as flying wings and um, uh, today it is again come back in the form of a stealth aircraft and uh, even in the future also in the future also some of the people even civilian aircraft people are proposing something called flying wings so that you know it is having its own advantages a lot of disadvantages also and uh, so maybe in the future when we you people in your um, future days when you design an aeroplane some of you or when you fly in an aeroplane you will definitely look at offbeat concepts which are not in the regular uh, you know regular line but it is offbeat but which will also have definitely a lot of advantages and then today we have a problem today we have a problem as you all know the earth is actually warming we have a problem daily you must be reading about climate change all of you young people are definitely familiar with global warming climate change i'm sure that many of you are admirers and followers of uh, teenage uh, climate activist greta thunberg and i'm sure that all of you know what fossil fuel usage is doing to the earth i don't have to tell you that one the presence of atmosphere carbon dioxide and other gases actually causes greenhouse effect global warming and you know we need to do something about it there is no escape from that aviation industry also is definitely one of the contributors because in an aircraft jet engine we are actually burning um, uh, kerosene based fuel you know jet fuel in the air and we are letting out all these um, damaging greenhouse gases like um, carbon dioxide carbon monoxide etc and there is a commitment from the aviation industry and from governments that we are going to cut down the use of this fossil fuel so fossil fuel how do you remove that how do you avoid use of um, this uh, petroleum based fuels one way is to first go back to the sun the sun which gives life to the earth and you go back to it solar powered aircraft so what you have here on the screen is actually the solar impulse 2 which circumnavigated the earth about 7 uh, 8 years ago it came to india also i'm uh, not sure whether all of you would have followed it at that time but there will be many amongst you who have uh, really followed this one it was circumnavigating the earth 
it actually went around india also touched down at many places it's uh, what you see on the top side of this plane is fully solar cells solar panels and you know they generate um, uh, and store the electricity in um, um, capacitors which is carried in the plane and lithium batteries and then even in the day time if you are generating when you are uh, outside of uh, the sun's view in the night the batteries power the propeller so that it can run non stop it can run non stop and so just look at the shape of the plane you know it's with a very high aspect ratio so you're telling the wing span divided by the crot and uh, it is powered by propellers on the front there are four propellers as i recall and um, of course it's very lightweight it's lightweight and then you know it was an experimental plane which has run around 2015 or 16 and um, so these are the kind of things which we need to look in the future how to avoid fossil fuel and then um, other challenges which are awaiting us you know you need to reduce the travel time how do you reduce travel time i keep on telling you in an aeroplane you have to reduce the travel time for people so for that what you need to do is uh, to have something like a scramjet a scramjet um, is what is known as a um, you know supersonic combustion ramjet Okay, we'll not go into the detail of that. And um, this particular one is actually what is known as X forty three. X forty three is a NASA plane, and I'm happy to tell you that our own country we have flown. ISRO has flown a scramjet combustor successfully around the three four years back, I think in two thousand sixteen. So the difference between this is suppose you look at you know in your automobile combustion chamber in automobile as you know there's a piston cylinder arrangement in which fuel burns. or you say ordinary plane let's say combustion chamber the flow of air will be at very low speed then only you get perfect combustion so you have to necessarily slow down the air to subsonic levels very low speed and then mix uh, fuel and air and then you know combust it so that is the ordinary means of combustion but if you want to really have very high hypersonic speed you cannot afford to do that you need to have combustion in this very fast air flow that is supersonic flow itself so it's one of the most complex technologies which is being attempted to be developed by many countries and we are definitely developed already uh, demonstrators for this and flown it successfully and this particular is actually nasa x43 which has successfully flown a few times and so in the future if you want to actually cut the travel times across the globe you know by say from 14 hours you want to reduce it to Five hours or four hours, there is no escape from flying fast. And present propulsion technology, you need to have go. You need to go in for something like this scramjet. Then only you can actually um, travel fast enough. So these are technologies of the future: scramjet propulsion. And this is a cross section of the uh, scramjet engine. And um, I'll take just a few more minutes, James. Yeah. I'll just take a few more minutes and close. So this is a typical cross section of a scramjet engine. Where the combustion chamber itself, uh, combustion takes place in supersonic condition. Okay, and uh, so that's one thing. And then, uh, yeah, I'm sure that many of you have been uh, or aware of this and would have followed this happily. All of you are aware that um, last year there were three missions to Mars. Three missions were launched, one by the Chinese, one by UAE, and the third by the Americans, which is actually Mars 2020. and today uh, you are every day seeing pictures of the mars um, american mission perseverance rover which landed on mars after traveling for 470 million kilometers just not the figure it has traveled for something like 470 million kilometers and it landed on mars and with it it carried a small helicopter it carried a small helicopter i'm sure that quite a few of you will know the name of this helicopter it is the ingenuity 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 helicopter and um, 100 years ago we flew on the earth for the first time okay propeller flight and after 100 years that is today 2021 man was able to put a helicopter a small helicopter on the surface of mars now as you are surely knowing the difference between the earth and mars are immense mars does not have a good atmosphere like earth you know the density air density there is negligible it's less than 100 times what we have on our earth so as we have seen earlier you know any flying vehicle it requires to generate lift any aeroplane or a helicopter or a propeller plane jet engine you need to generate lift for flying 
and if the air is not dense enough it's very difficult to generate the lift so here you have marvel engineer it is the ingenuity helicopter which has been transported to mars and it has already flown on mars i think around five times five times this has flown on mars can we imagine this situation 100 years ago anybody would be thinking that this is all science fiction but today we are in a position where we have successfully flown this it has flown for about uh, 120 meters or even more it has risen to a height of um, i think around 5 meter 4 to 5 meters and uh, five different occasions it has flown and the designers one great thing they have done one symbolic but great thing this ingenuity carries a piece of fabric from the right brothers first machine this ingenuity they have attached a fabric piece from the very first machine which flew the right brothers uh, uh, machine so that is uh, how it all things all go around and come back in circles and if somebody who was in the 19th century is uh, listening to this or you know looking at this one it's all like julius verne predicted it's all science fiction but then today all these things have come true and they are going to go ahead now this ingenuity is actually opening a new opportunity because till today whenever we have gone to another planet you know there is no way of moving around on the planet except by ground tracked vehicles or wheeled vehicle like um, rovers when uh, apollo people went to the moon they moved around on the uh, moon using you know uh, rovers which are heavy and then they have to traverse over the ground and uh, even in mars itself there in the last 20 years there have been many missions which has actually put rovers on mars and uh, as you all know we have also isro had a very successful mission to mars we of course orbited it there was an mom mission in 2014 uh, but many other countries have already landed and especially americans are already moving around on mars they have covered large distances on mars they are operating many other missions like curiosity um so many other uh, rovers on mars but then when we have gone in for something like um, uh, helicopter it opens another chapter because using an helicopter you can fly around on mars now we have demonstrated that you can fly on another planet maybe tomorrow you go to some other planet also uh, then also you can do that and this gives you the power now even if you don't send a man immediately you can allow this to land there and then fly around mars exploring because mars is full of surprises surely like other planets it every um, every few kilometers or few few things will be full of surprises we all know now that uh, mars you know there were rivers once upon a time on mars once upon a time rivers were running on mars today there is no uh, there are no uh, rivers on mars uh, whereas um, once upon a time we know there were active rivers on mars and uh, there are poles on the mars um, uh, i mean ice is there on the pole, um, uh, poles of the martian uh, mars and there are so many things and mars is actually now many people are targeting landing on mars like uh, you know the spacex and other private people are also planning to you know target mars and uh, surely in the next uh, year in your time when you people are actually entering the professional field the students surely are going to have much more action on mars probably some of you may even think about landing on mars and flying around on mars so surely is going to happen it's not science fiction okay so that is one thing i wanted to tell you people and uh, i think uh, now i am coming to the end of my talk so what we have tried to cover today is actually various aspects of the development on the evolution of um, aircraft and um, i'm sure that many of you will have a lot of questions and i will be happy to take questions i think uh, James is around. Yeah. Yeah, James. So let, your me, thank you, let me thank all of you for uh, yeah. listening. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jasper Lal. Uh, so it's really very evident you did lots of homework to make uh, such a beautiful and uh, informative presentation. Thanks a lot. Our students, uh, let us give him a big clap. It was a good presentation. I assume you enjoyed it. thank you um you can stop the screen share sir right uh, yeah so yesterday actually some of the students were asking uh, the about time travel right uh, so today i think we have traveled uh, about 100 years past 
from the very beginning of aircraft development to today. So we really did a time travel to the past today. Thanks again to our speaker, Sri uh, Jasper Lal. And Sir has shown us how the aircraft evolved to today's stage. Uh, the passenger aircraft, military aircraft, and a lot of aircraft he has shown us. And he also showed us the glimpses of pioneers who struggled to make flying a reality. Right? So he told us many fundas, what's about uh, recording the flying. And he also gave you the challenges towards the future, what you people have to take up. So it was a beautiful talk. Uh, now it's a time for a few questions, few doubts what you have. And as I said yesterday, either you can type into the chat box or you can unmute your mic and ask also. I'm giving you the permission to unmute yourself. So questions can come. Time is yours. Sir? Yeah, sir, thank you. Yeah. Sir, in air shows, I have, I have seen that the fighter planes have a very high maneuverability, going sharply up and coming down, uh, rolling. So, what is the reason, uh, what is the technology used behind that high maneuverability? What are the changes in that fighter planes compared to our ordinary planes? Fine. So, um, see the fighter planes, you know, the fighter planes, even though we classify them as a uh, fighter, you know, it can be further subdivided into something like an interceptor. And uh, the fighters, what we have seen, you know, I was showing you a uh, picture of the dogfights from the olden days, where pilots actually face each other one to one and then, you know, try to shoot on the other guy. So, because they are at very low speed in those days, they were able to do that, right? But all the time we are trying to actually improve our speed or increase our speed and meet the enemy. And today we are both of it, uh, both ourselves and the enemies are at high speed. No way you can meet each other and fight it out like in the dogfight days. So today each of these aeroplanes carry radars, you know, sideways looking radars, downward looking radars, upward looking radars. All kind of radars are there. It is full of instrument panels and with radars and all that. And you carry all kind of missiles. And today there is no honor in fighting, honestly speaking. Earlier days there would have been a you know chivalry or a honor stay, um, you know, something like a honor in fighting where you don't shoot on your enemy behind his back. But today, every anywhere you will be trying to hide yourself and shoot him off from behind or from as far away as possible. So today one aircraft will be launching a missile at another aircraft with the, at the distance of 10 kilometers, 20 kilometers, etc. etc. That's how the fight is taking place today. And suppose an enemy enters your aerospace, before he can drop his bomb or something, you have to rise very fast to counter him. So the rate of climb, we have parameters like rate of climb. You know? These are the things which you're looking for in an interceptor. As far as a fighter is concerned, you know, suppose somebody is trying to send a missile to you, you have to evade him, right? People follow different, different evading techniques. Let me not go into that. But some people follow some particular techniques and uh, you need to maneuver your plane. Then only you can get out of the path of a missile, right? So that is where you require high uh, maneuverability and you also require high speed. That is how the today's fighter is shaped because most of these fighters are supersonic. In fact, all of them will be. And uh, they are extremely highly maneuverable. You can look at their wing surfaces with flaps and with this and two end tailed and so on and so forth. And they'll be all full of armaments. You can see the platform of all these planes, you know, full of packed missiles. So that is how it is. So you are trying to all these things. High maneuverability. That's why you require high maneuverability, high rate of climb, high speed. It's all basic requirements from a fighter. So I think it answers Sardik. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. You have one more question? Yes, sir. Uh, please go ahead. Sir, recently NASA launched a, a helicopter to Mars known as Ingenuity. So in that, without an uh, atmosphere, how can it fly? Okay. Is it, it, know, it is not that no atmosphere. There is a very light atmosphere in Mars. And for that pressure of atmosphere, it is designed. That's why it's flying in Mars. Right? Yeah, I'll add one more point to that. I'll add one more point that James was telling. The atmosphere of Mars is almost 100th of what is there on the Earth. Yeah, the density. very light. light. 
so the helicopter blade has to be you know suitably designed to take care of that one and it operates at high speed the rotor the, the, the helicopter blade spins at a very high speed so that it's able to generate the lift and also you'll find in that figure what i showed you know there are twin blade arrangements there are there are two layers of blades what is known as contra rotors so these kind of peculiar things are done and it is experimental believe it or not before this first take, uh, first flight people were worried whether it is going to fly whether it's going to lift off but then it was done exceeded the expectations already completed the scheduled flights and now they are going to test it to extremes that's the situation yeah so jasper yes. lal there is another yes. question yes. in the chat box yes. uh, uh sri mrk menon is asking do you have any information about the original right flyer the spirit of st louis Uh, any information about the flyer yeah the um, i think mr menon will be definitely know even more than me on this particular yeah. thing. and uh, for the right flyer i think i don't know i think he can tell us in which uh, museum it is being preserved i think the spirit of st louis is preserved in some museum both are surely preserved in some museums yeah, yeah. perhaps he can tell us actually where it is uh, sir can you can you add yes uh, can, can you hear me yeah okay first of all jasper sir as an aerospace educator i would like to say that you have given a very comprehensive coverage of the evolution of flight i'm sure these 75 children must be really fascinated by all this i had a lot of other boys and girls from all over india who wanted to tune in and when the program started in malayalam they were texting me and saying this is all in malayalam so i said just hold on i don't know whether jasper sir will talk in english or not but somehow they all disappeared they got exams actually but that being said the reason i just broke in is that i actually studied museum management that's my field in aviation and i have seen all the museums and with respect to the sr 71 and also the bright flyer and also the spirit of st louis all these original aircrafts are currently on display at the smithsonian science and air and space museum in washington dc and uh, i've seen these couple of times uh they are religiously worked uh, by top class uh, workmen to make sure they are in pristine condition you are not allowed to touch them you can only see them from maybe 10 or 15 feet uh, and it's very you know your your enda pariya romangal ingane kayyum ingane enittu irukum like nammal historical light or sahana kaanumbo like the moon yes, rock yes. when you see it yes and as far as the uh, concord is concerned that is also available in new york city those of you who are lucky enough to go there there is a museum called the uh interpret sea and air museum i did my graduate studies on that museum on that particular ship it's an aircraft carrier and there is a live uh, aircraft there which was taken from the hudson river and then pushed on top of the carrier deck so i just thought i will let you know all this for those students who are interested in history thank you god bless thank you, you sir. Jane, sir thank you thank you thank, thank you, you. Uh, sir in the chat box uh, who has asked noel nobly is asking if you increase the sharpness whether we can increase the speed as per line that's a question okay uh, just increasing the sharpness by sharpness you know what to you perhaps um, refer to is actually reducing the drag i'm sure that what you have in the back of your mind is how to reduce the drag and uh, that definitely depends on the speed of your plane definitely if you are on a subsonic flight you know you will be using a particular technology with rounded or smooth contours so that your streamlines part beautifully and if you are in supersonic flight or hypersonic flight you can see the shape of a rocket or today we have seen the 15 shape or something like that or even sr 71 you see they are shaped like a rocket so that is the design for high speed flight but then all these require you to reduce the drag and also increase the thrust for achieving you require very powerful engines you require a reduction in the thrust and of course you need proper aerodynamic shape okay okay washmi is asking on which principle does aircraft fly Okay, it's not one principle. There are many things. In which aspect, Lalit, can you just give a? Yeah, it is. You know, so he is telling it's not a one principle. You know, it's a. It's a. I don't know what you can call that as a principle. You have to generate lift and then fly. You know, the lift has to be more than the weight, and then you are airborne, and then you have to go forward by using a thrust. Yeah. So any bird which is flying, or any eagle which is flying, or anything which is flying, or a humans which is flying. we all have to do that by you know generating lift so that you are countering the gravity you have weight so you are leaving the ground and then for moving forward you require a propulsive force for that either you use a propeller or a jet or even you know you do, nowadays you'll be seeing so so many whatsapp videos you know where people are flying around using jet packs isn't it i'm sure that yeah. even yesterday somebody sent a um, uh, jet pack a british company okay. so that again all are using jets 
this jets is actually what he keeps uh, floating the reaction from the jets the reaction from the jets keeps you lifted moving in one direction the other direction and of course you develop skill it's a, otherwise you will you know tumble all over <laughs> so it requires a special skill in fact how do you move around in space i'm sure that many of you friends and friends would have seen people space walking you know walking around in the deep space and so on and outside the shuttle etc so they all move around using jets these are known as jet packs there are a specific designed you know jet packs you know uh, which these fellows carry on their body and the backpack etc and also high pressure nitrogen usually typically they'll carry and using that only they'll move around okay so I yeah another question uh, irene rose peter is asking me an interesting question could planes be flown without a pilot in the future uh, why future uh, yeah. sorry uh, irene even today it's possible Uh, but of course, the passenger aircraft and all that, uh, considering the safety and all that, the pilots are still there. But there are planes or aircraft which can fly. Absolutely, whatever. absolutely. And you know, as you know, militaries, all militaries are using what are known as UAVs, unmanned aerial vehicles, and you know, yeah. drones and all these things. You know, there are now drones are so much developed, so much yes. developed, they can remain airborne for days. And not only that, even ordinary. planes you can set the keep the settings and people there are no many cases you will find people even sleep off yeah what a pilot is flying so it is yeah, the is there a room pilot. inside the cockpit for the pilot somebody is asking yes it's a room by itself pilot is sitting there and flying by aircraft um, yeah what is stealth technology which is being approached by super pop uh, who is asking varshini Yeah, Varshini, I'm sure you saw that you know the two slides what I showed you there. That is, you know, the stealth technology because you need to avoid detection. Suppose you want to bomb another country before you are shot down, you have to do the bomb. The enemy is actually waiting for you with this radar to track you and shoot you down if you try to go on bombing. So you have to escape this radar. So the only way to escape this radar nowadays is by using stealth technology. Otherwise, what you have to do is you know fly very very high, but nowadays even that will not work because missiles will be able to shoot on that. So that is how the necessity for stealth technology comes. Still, it is a highly secretive technology. If a plane crashes or something, I'm sure everybody will be concentrating there to pick out the technology. So they are still guarding this technology. Yeah, we will be incidentally, incidentally, uh, yeah, different speed, hypersonic and supersonic. It's, okay, uh, just I'll, I'll complete that and then come back to this. Huh? Yeah. So talking about stealth technology, nowadays you are even reading about stealth ships. You know, even frigates, the you know ships, warships, etc. They are trying to use um, uh, make them invisible because ships are under threat from everywhere. For example, now you know the Americans have so many aircraft carriers, right? You have aircraft carriers that is what is used to project their power, but then it's a sitting duck. An aircraft carrier is literally a sitting duck. It carries hundreds of aeroplanes, can defend itself. But you know the latest geopolitical alignments. People say China can knock off one of the American aircraft carriers. The world will be open. So Chinese have mastered the art of you know attacking from 40 kilometers, 50 kilometers with missiles, and an aircraft will be vulnerable. Aircraft carrier. So that is why now they are going towards stealth technology, even in ships. And coming to the other question, what are we, can you please repeat the question? Hypersonic and supersonic. What's the difference? Somebody is asking. Yeah, supersonic is anything above the speed of sound. You call it supersonic. You know, anything about the speed of sound, uh, the speed of your plane, or if you are traveling in air, your speed divided by the local speed of sound is known as the uh, yes. Mach number. Okay. So once you are reaching the uh, once you are reaching the speed of sound, it is known as the sonic. Sonic, and then when you cross the speed of sound, you become greater than Mach number one. It is known as supersonic flight, and that is just above Mach number one. When typically you go much faster, like Mach number five, six, etc., then it is referred to as hypersonic. It is much much faster than supersonic. You are in the hypersonic region. Okay, so I was showing you X15. For X15, flies at Mach number six or seven. So really fast hypersonic. Yeah, somebody is asking the materials used to for uh, fighter crafts. Yeah. And, uh... See, in the as I told you, the original Wright plane was made with wood and fabric, wood and fabric, and then you know later on it became metallic and then pressurized cabins. And uh, nowadays mostly we deal uh, really on titanium alloys because we need high temperature and you know lightweight. So titanium is one of the titanium alloys is the most favored um, uh, material. Okay, high temperature, lightweight. 
titan amyloids and, and of course composites yeah how can i forget composites of late you know many of the passenger planes are going to 50% plus composites because composites gives you strength composites give you lightweight so many of these passenger planes including the boeing i think 767 i am not sure the number they are 50% or more composites so it's a material of the future is lightweight material like um titanium plus composites the question is whether it is uh, different from spacecrafts or not that is the question whether spacecraft and aircraft use the same material that is the question yeah okay okay i think um, uh, in fact uh, similar material one should say similar material because in the spacecraft also requirement is lightweight of course you don't require that much of a strength perhaps in the spacecraft whereas in aeroplane you require very good strength So okay, both, so both the places, high temperature and lightweight. That's yeah, another right. question. Somebody is asking whether civilians can fly supersonic. Oh well, I was showing you one aircraft, which is the Concorde aircraft. That is the only civilian aircraft, along with the Russian T-144. Civilian aircraft. Uh, that is the only thing which was flying supersonic, and it was available for any passengers. You know, even though they were charging very high, they were typically flying between. London and New York or London and Paris and all these things and travel time will be less than 50% or even less by then only exclusively rich people were flying there because the prices were very high and another point is you know the concorde you are talking about supersonic travel it's a very narrow plane so not too many people enjoy from what i heard it's a um, constrained and it's not wide enough like a wide body jet like say 747 or 380 so um, uh, perhaps what they understand is you know, it may be luxurious possibly but then uh, it may not be liked by everybody however coming back to your question it is the concord presently there is no supersonic transport as far as i know okay yeah. whether uh, charged batteries can be used to fly the aircraft technology well we have seen you know like in that uh, solar impulse i showed you which is a solar powered plane it is uh, flown with solar power and then batteries only that is how you are playing it for 24 hours of the day Okay, in which layer of atmosphere do aircraft fly? Somebody is asking. Okay, see the atmosphere, as you people know, um, uh, it goes on as you keep on going up. You know, it goes on thinning, thinning, thinning. The density goes on changing. I think Datan sir is in the. Uh, uh, he has joined us. I hope. Yeah, I think he has joined. Um, it's my honor, sir, that you are in the audience. And yesterday he spared some time to talk to me. he gave me some suggestions which they have definitely included in today's presentation and in fact sir was in fact telling me about um, uh, even international standard atmosphere we have what is known as the international standard atmosphere okay it's a standard atmospheric conditions as you keep going up the temperature decreases increases decreases and so on density goes on decreasing pressure decreases so um, uh, the question is you know the surrounding uh, temperatures are different for example If you are flying in a transport plane today, you will be typically flying around nine to eleven kilometers, which is ambient temperature. You are perfectly shielded from the surrounding. The surrounding temperature will be minus fifty-six degrees. So this is the kind of variation what you are finding, and so at different and again and again, if you are at high speed, you have to necessarily fly at a higher altitude because then the drag becomes lower because density of the air is lower. whereas if you are flying at a low altitude your density and the drag you know the drag is directly proportional to density of the air rho v square it will be going the equation will go so directly or proportional to the density so naturally you will encounter enormous amount of drag if you are flying high speed at low altitude so automatically you will keep going up and some of these planes like what i was showing you sr71 as it operated very very high almost you know um 80000 feet and so on um u2 operates around 80000 to 90000 feet and so on so where the atmosphere is so stratified and um, incidentally you know the atmosphere persists for around 40 kilometers one should say 20 30 40 by that time it becomes so tenuous space starts literally yeah i think there are many questions in the chat box but uh, most of them are more or less repeat so the answers should have already come but this question maybe you can see uh, he is asking what happens to the lightning hits the airplane uh, i think yeah, i think lightning does hit lightning does hit airplanes occasionally and lightning does hit rocket launchers also very interestingly yeah. rocket launchers also very uh, very frequently hits and if your communication system is protected from the you know shorting and other problems and of course almost always they are protected and they also have redundancy etc 
uh, we will not have any issue as such. In fact, there have been some launches. Um, uh, in fact, uh, I may just divert for a moment. Apollo 12, for example, you know, when it was just clearing the launch pad, it was struck by massive lightning. Apollo 12 carrying people and the power system went out. Power system went blank and people thought mission is lost. But then it came back. Backup was there and it came back. So it is routinely, it could happen. But sometimes, you know, the turbulence associated with these clouds, it's extremely dangerous so when you are flying into turbulence. And when sometimes you are caught in storms, especially, you know, in long range flights when they are flying high, you cannot always avoid it. And then, you know, one has to be very, very careful. That's where the pilot's experience and skill and all that come into the picture. Yeah. Yeah, Jacob Abraham is asking why Concorde is not being used now, today. Yeah, the Concorde way it is not being used, as I told you, is unbearable fuel consumption. It's mm. enormous fuel consumption. And the other problems are, you know, um, uh, sound, enormous amount of sound. It's like a rocket taking off. And sonic booms are created all the time. You know, sonic boom, whenever your velocity cross that of the sound velocity, there are shock waves generated on your body. So these planes, you know, especially a big plane like Concorde, you know, will generate very strong sonic booms. I think if you are sitting, you know, in your living in uh, near some military airports and all that, occasionally you will be finding uh, sonic booms taking place. You know, when the uh, when the pilots break the sound barrier at low altitude and then you know you hear shock waves travel and hit the ground, this causes a lot of damage on the ground. Like your window glasses will break, vibrations will happen, and then you will feel pressure overall. So that is again a problem. Many countries banned the landing and takeoff of Concorde. Even India, as far as I know, we never allowed the Concorde except for one initial time to land or take off in our air force. That is so because of these two reasons essentially. And uh, the same plane, you know, people are not ready to put in money for further development. That's it. Okay, sir. So I think uh, all the questions in the chat box almost we have answered. And uh, it's almost 12 o'clock now. So we will give one chance to somebody who could not try, I mean, type the question to the chat box if you want to ask something, some longer question or something like that. If anyone is there, one question also we will allow. It's almost 12 now. We have to close now. Anyone to ask a question? No one? Okay, then I think uh, it's time we conclude now. It's 12 o'clock. <laughs> Uh, and I'm very happy to see Dr. Nainan has come back and join. Uh, Dathan Sab has joined. George Bush is already here. Uh, so thanks a lot. And um, I again uh, remind uh, the students, uh, I will be giving a questionnaire in the uh, WhatsApp group. Somebody asked in the chat box, what is a WhatsApp group? See, the, the when you registered for this particular uh, lecture series, I included you in a WhatsApp group. That's the WhatsApp group I am referring to. And if someone is not there in that WhatsApp group, please send me your number, etc. I will add you there. Okay. So, uh, so we are ending the four day uh, science lecture series today. Uh, definitely President has promised us. Uh, we will come back with more lectures, hopefully. Uh, it all depends on you, uh, whether uh, you can uh, spend time like this. Now it's lockdown. I know you had plenty of time to attend. But if the schools reopen or the online classes started, you may not find this much of time. So in the feedback, uh, you can uh, put your convenience, etc. So that we will try to devise the timing and lectures accordingly. So uh, let us close today. And let us thank uh, all the people who has uh, tirelessly worked for this one. And I thank all the participants also. And I invite uh, the General Secretary of YMCA, uh, Sri Shaji James, I think he's here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Shaji James, I request you to propose uh, the order of thanks. Uh, Science lecture, Namuka, informative item, three things could Jungle Panga de Guana, Yangal Bridge Chilla. Nala response I know, Lapa to Yangal Kirti. Summer Lendu Chayana and Agri Chiri in the Samet Idano, Pashangalai to IMC, the summer Valare, the Dandamas and the Kurna, Valare, Padre told them activity with Namla Chayana than 
തിരുവനന്തപുരത്ത് ഏറ്റവും വലിയ സമ്മർ പ്രോഗ്രാം ചെയ്യുന്ന ഒരു സ്ഥലമായിരുന്നു ഐ എം സി കഴിഞ്ഞ രണ്ടായിരത്തി പത്തൊമ്പതിൽ വരെ അഞ്ഞൂറോളം കുട്ടികളായിരുന്നു നമ്മുടെ സമ്മർ പ്രോഗ്രാമില് കിടന്നു വന്ന ഫുൾ ടൈം ഐ എം സിയിൽ ഒരു കുട്ടികളുടെ ഒരു ഉത്സവമായിരുന്നു ഏപ്രിൽ മെയ് മാസങ്ങൾ എന്ന് പറയുന്നത് കഴിഞ്ഞ വർഷവും ഈ വർഷവും നമ്മൾക്ക് ഈ കോവിഡിന്റെ പശ്ചാത്തലത്തിൽ ലോക്ക്ഡൌൺ ആയിരുന്നു കഴിഞ്ഞ വർഷം ഒന്നും ചെയ്യാനായിട്ട് സാധിച്ചില്ല ഈ വർഷം പല കാര്യങ്ങളും നമ്മൾ ആസൂത്രണം ചെയ്തെങ്കിലും ഒന്നും തന്നെ നമുക്ക് മുന്നോട്ട് കൊണ്ടുപോകാനായിട്ട് സാധിക്കാത്ത അവസരത്തിലാണ് ബഹുമാനായ പ്രസിഡന്റ് ഷെവിലാർ കോശ് എം ജോർജ് സാറ് ഒരു തോട്ട് പറഞ്ഞത് നമുക്കൊരു സമ്മർ പ്രോഗ്രാമിന്റെ ഭാഗമായിട്ടൊരു ഒരു ലെക്ചർ സീരിയസ് മൂന്നോ നാലോ വണ്ണം എങ്കിലും നടത്താൻ സാധിക്കുമെങ്കിൽ കുട്ടികൾക്ക് അതെങ്കിലും ഉപകരിക്കട്ടെ എന്നുള്ള വിശ്വാസത്തില് അങ്ങനെ മുന്നോട്ട് തുടങ്ങിയ ഒരു സംരംഭമായിരുന്നു ഇത് വളരെ ഭംഗിയായിട്ട് കഴിഞ്ഞ നാല് ദിവസം നമുക്ക് നടത്തുവാനായിട്ട് സാധിച്ചു എന്നതിൽ ഞങ്ങൾക്ക് വളരെ സംതൃപ്തരാണ് ഞങ്ങൾ കൂടുതൽ ഞങ്ങൾക്ക് ആത്മവിശ്വാസം നൽകുന്നുണ്ട് കൂടുതൽ പരിപാടികൾ ചെയ്യുന്നതിനായിട്ട് ഈ അവസരത്തിൽ എല്ലാവർക്കും പ്രത്യേകമായിട്ട് കൃതജ്ഞത അർപ്പിക്കുക എന്നുള്ളതാണ് എന്റെ കർത്തവ്യം ഇന്നത്തെ നമ്മുടെ നമുക്ക് ഇന്ന് ലെക്ചർ സീരീസിൽ നേതൃത്വം നൽകിയത് ജാസ്പർ ലാൽ സാറാണ് സാറിനെ ഓൾറെഡി ഇവിടെ ഇൻട്രൊഡ്യൂസ് ചെയ്തിരിക്കുന്നു സാറിനോടുള്ള സ്നേഹപൂർവ്വമായി നന്ദി വൈ എം സിക്ക് വേണ്ടിയിട്ടും ഇവിടെ കിടന്നു വന്നിരിക്കുന്ന എല്ലാ കൊച്ചു കൂട്ടുകാർക്ക് വേണ്ടിയിട്ടും ഞാൻ പ്രത്യേകമായി അർപ്പിച്ചുകൊള്ളുന്നത് കഴിഞ്ഞ മൂന്ന് ദിവസങ്ങളിൽ നമുക്ക് ക്ലാസ്സുകൾക്ക് നേതൃത്വം നൽകിയത് നയനാൻ സാറുണ്ട് നയനാൻ സാറ് വൈ എം സിയുടെ പാട്ടാണെങ്കിൽ തന്നെ കഴിഞ്ഞ രണ്ടു ദിവസങ്ങളിൽ നയനാൻ സാർ ക്ലാസ്സുകൾ അറ്റൻഡ് ചെയ്തു ഒരു ദിവസത്തെ ക്ലാസ്സിന് നേതൃത്വം നൽകിയ ഡോക്ടർ നയനാൻ സാറിനുള്ള സ്നേഹപൂർവ്വമായി നന്ദി വൈ എം സിക്ക് വേണ്ടിയിട്ടും കിടന്നു വന്നിരിക്കുന്ന എല്ലാവർക്കും വേണ്ടിയിട്ട് ഞാൻ ഈ അവസരത്തിൽ അർപ്പിച്ചു കൊള്ളട്ടെ ബഹുമാനായ എം സി ദത്തൻ സാറ് ഗ്രൂപ്പിലുണ്ടെന്ന് വിചാരിക്കുന്നു സാറായിരുന്നു ഇതിന്റെ ഫസ്റ്റ് ടോക്ക് ഇതിന്റെ ഇനാഗ്രേറ്റ് ചെയ്തത് സാറായിരുന്നു ഞങ്ങളുടെ ഒരു ഇൻസ്പിറേഷൻ എന്ന് പറയുന്നത് സാറിനോടുള്ള സ്നേഹപൂർവ്വമായി നന്ദി ഈ അവസരത്തിൽ ഞാൻ പ്രത്യേകമായിട്ട് അർപ്പിച്ചു കൊള്ളുന്നത് അതോടൊപ്പം തന്നെ ഇതിന് നേരത്തെ നൽകിയ അനന്ത നാരായണൻ സാർ കഴിഞ്ഞ ഇന്നലത്തെ നമ്മുടെ സെഷൻസ് നേരത്തെ നൽകിയ സാറിനോടുള്ള സ്നേഹപൂർവ്വമായി നന്ദി ഔദ്യോഗികമായിട്ട് വൈ എം സിക്ക് വേണ്ടിയിട്ട് ഞാൻ ഈ അവസരത്തിൽ അർപ്പിച്ചു കൊള്ളട്ടെ അതിലുപരിയായിട്ട് ഈ മൂന്ന് നാല് ദിവസത്തെ ഈ പ്രോഗ്രാം ശരിക്കും കോർഡിനേറ്റ് ചെയ്തത് ഇതിനൊരു മോഡറേറ്റർ ആയിട്ട് നിന്നത് ബഹുമാനായി എം സി എം ജി ജെയിംസ് സാറാണ് സാറിനോടുള്ള സ്നേഹപൂർവ്വമായി നന്ദി വൈ എം സിക്ക് വേണ്ടിയിട്ട് അതോടൊപ്പം കിടന്നു വന്നിരിക്കുന്ന എല്ലാ കൊച്ചു കൂട്ടുകാർക്കും വേണ്ടിയിട്ട് ഞാൻ പ്രത്യേകമായിട്ട് അർപ്പിച്ചു കൊള്ളുന്നു ഇതിനെല്ലാത്തിനും നേതൃത്വം നൽകിയത് വൈ എം സിയുടെ പ്രസിഡന്റ് ഷെബില ഡോക്ടർ കോശി എം ജോർജ് സാറിനോട് സാറിനോടുള്ള സ്നേഹപൂർവ്വമായി നന്ദി ഞാൻ ഈ അവസരത്തിൽ പ്രത്യേകമായിട്ട് അർപ്പിക്കട്ടെ വൈ എം സിയുടെ അക്കാഡമി കമ്മിറ്റിയാണ് ഇതിനെല്ലാം ഓർഗനൈസ് ചുക്കാൻ പിടിക്കുന്നത് അക്കാഡമിക് കമ്മിറ്റിയുടെ ചെയർമാൻ ഡോക്ടർ ബിജോ എം എസ് രാജ് കമ്മിറ്റി അംഗങ്ങൾ എന്നിവരോടുള്ള സ്നേഹപൂർവ്വമായി നന്ദി അവസരത്തിൽ പ്രത്യേകമായിട്ട് ഞാൻ അർപ്പിച്ചുകൊള്ളുന്നു അതിലുപരിയായിട്ട് വളരെ താല്പര്യത്തോടു കൂടി ഞങ്ങളുടെ ഈ സെഷനിൽ പങ്കെടുത്ത ഈ കൂട്ടുകാരോടൊപ്പം തന്നെ കൊച്ചു മെഡിക്കുമാരും മെഡിക്കുകളുമായ കൂട്ടുകാരോടൊപ്പം ഉപരിയായിട്ട് അവർ മാതാപിതാക്കൾ ഇതിൽ ഞങ്ങൾക്ക് ഇൻസ്പിറേഷൻ ആയിട്ട് നിൽക്കുന്ന വളരെയധികം ആളാണ് ഒന്ന് ജോർജ് കോച്ച് സാറ് കഴിഞ്ഞ നാല് ദിവസം ഉണ്ടായിരുന്നു എം ആർ കെ മേനോൻ സാർ ഉണ്ടായിരുന്നു അങ്ങനെ വളരെ പ്രഗത്ഭരായ ആളുകൾ ഇതിന്റെ പിന്നില് ഞങ്ങൾക്ക് ഇൻസ്പിറേഷൻ ആയിട്ട് ഉണ്ടായിരുന്നു എന്നുള്ളതിൽ വളരെ സന്തോഷമുണ്ട് തുടർന്ന് ഞങ്ങൾക്ക് മുന്നോട്ട് പോകാനായിട്ടുള്ള ഇൻസ്പിറേഷൻ നിങ്ങളാണ് നിങ്ങളുടെ എല്ലാവരുടെയും ആത്മാർത്ഥമായ സഹകരണവും പ്രതീക്ഷിച്ചുകൊണ്ട് കിടന്നു വന്നിരിക്കുന്ന പങ്കെടുത്ത എല്ലാ കൊച്ചു കൂട്ടുകാർക്കും ഒരിക്കൽ കൂടി നന്ദി പറഞ്ഞുകൊണ്ട് നിർത്തുന്നു നന്ദി നമസ്കാരം so we will uh, end this session now and hopefully we will come back okay 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 ella varke nanni thank you <laughs> thank you sir thank you okay okay thank you all my wonderful lecture series thank you <laughs>